allow the call of God to come into your life and then you apply yourself completely to that. Everything the Father's promised becomes yours. If you apply half of yourself, half of what He's promised becomes yours. 10% of yourself, 10% of what He's promised becomes yours. I believe that what, it's really what happens because God is so loving. He's so merciful because I've watched this go down for many years. And I've seen the Lord bless people that gave 5% of their life to Him. They had 5% of the blessing of God in life. I believe it really does come down to the whole scope of things as a man sows, that shall he also reap. You sow 5% of your life into the Lord, you're reaping, you know, as it were, 5% of the in, in unlimited benefits that He has for you. Because God is just so good. God is just so good. I was re reading this morning at Deuteronomy and you know, the Lord says, I, I carried you like a son, like a father carries a son. And yet you, you just wouldn't cooperate with me. And this is Papa. This is the way he is. And, you know, it's like, you know, a, a little guy doesn't run out of energy. He doesn't. As long as he's doing something he wants to do, it's just wide open. It's flat out continually. But just get him to follow you somewhere that he doesn't want to go. And he's sitting down. He's tired. Huh? He didn't want to go there. Well, what did dad do? He didn't leave him. He goes back and he picks him up and he carries him. He said, I carried you, Nishi. I bear you up. I bore you. I carried you. You didn't want to come with me, so I just went to pick you. He's throwing a fit, so I just went over there and I picked you up. And I gave you my signs and I gave you my wonders and I gave you my tokens of my love and my grace. People, I want you to know, you're at many people are acting like that this life is all that they have and when this is it, it's over. You may say that you believe, and this is what the Lord spoke to me very strong concerning the church, and you're the church, so I'm going to declare this thing to you. You may say that you believe, but you're living your life as though it's going to end when you die. And reality of it is, is this is just the very beginning. All this is is preparation all this is is moments of decision making. All this is is a sorting out. And then out of all of that, there are those who rise up with great passion. A, a person was telling me just the other day, oh, God's going to do this great wonders in, in, in the earth and there's going to be a mighty army. And I, and I said, I, I agree with that. I believe that because I, I've heard the same thing. The Lord is going to raise up a great army and it's going to be many, not just a few. But the reality of it is up up until this time, we've only had one or two that was willing to sell out completely to God, to really go all the way with God. I mean, there, there's just way too much of we put our jobs first, it's more important, our pursuit of our own interest, our own entertainment, it goes on and on and on. And then whatever we may have left over, whatever we might be able to scrape together for the Lord at, after the, all the bills are paid, because I want you to understand, our money, the way we spend our money, has a lot of a reflection on the way we spend our heart. You must understand this. And we'll pay our bills and our mortgage and our car payments and you know, and the clothes and saving for a vacation and saving for this. And meanwhile, what's going on with the Lord seems to be a little bit taxing now. Wait a minute, what are you saying? You, you're talking about me giving and I listen, I, I, I've already, you don't understand all my bills, I gotta pay and all the things. That, and we say the table of the Lord is contemptible. We say the cha it's just too challenging. It's too much pressure that somebody's putting on me to do more. I can't take this. I'm overloaded already tending to my own self-interest and need. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Father's just looking for a people that will all of a sudden begin to turn their hearts and affections over to Him and recognize there's far more than what's been happening and taking place in your daily life. There's far more in His plans for you. Some people become despairing and hopeless because they haven't been able to do the things that they thought that they should do, of course, for the Lord, you know. Huh? You understand it's all for the Lord. But reality of it is, is Papa gives an anointing, and when he anoints, say nothing can hold you back, and nothing can hold you back, and nothing can get in your way. 
You can point your finger of accusation and blame everybody around you if you want. The reality of it is. And nobody's going to be standing there with you except for you on that day when the Lord brings you into an account for your soul. And we just want to make you ready. We just want to prepare you in Jesus' mighty name. I want you to, I want you to, clean, the, I want you to clean the stuff off of your plate. People are going to say, oh, but my children, the Lord, that's why they didn't go into the promised land. Oh, but my children, oh, but my jobs, oh, but my things I got to do at home, oh, but by my earthly interests. And he says, no, 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 you're not going to go in like this. If you hold on to your life and preserve your life about the time Father's ready to take you into a whole nother revelation of the inheritance that he has for you, you're going to draw back and preserve your life. So you're going to have to be trained how to let go of your life and how to release your life if you're going to be aware of those moments and days and opportunities that Father has for you because it's going to come on you at a moment in time that's going to be an inopportune moment in time. It's not going to fit into your plans. You are planning on going on vacation you already had it all set up you already had all the savings just for that one purpose and now all of a sudden God comes and he shows you okay I'm gonna allow you now to step into a greater opportunity in me but you just were well Lord you're going up for, okay thank you Lord but first but first but but first I, I, I got I gotta go over here and do this and he's simply gonna say as he did to others no problem no problem. Of course, he said a little bit long. He said it a little bit louder than that, didn't he? Yeah. Okay, no oh, man, it's got a butt first. It's worthy of what I got for him. And that's why Paul says, "I pray that the Lord will count you worthy. That there will not be in your life anything like a butt first. But God, you're going to have to understand. We're busy over here. We made some commitments. We've got to do this and we've got to do that. I'm in debt. I'm enslaved to man." And I've got to take care of him. I tell you right now, if you become a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ, he'll promote you above all of those who have uh, hold debts over your head. He'll pay off your bills. you just got to step out and walk on the water with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Well, you can be seated. I know it's a little warm in here. And uh, we just... We're just, we're just looking forward to the wonderful things that the Lord is doing and, and about to do in, in the midst of his people. Everywhere throughout the earth, God's setting things up. I'm going to tell you right now, if you're living for the here and the now, then you are making a grave mistake. You're very nearsighted. I don't want you to live for the here and the now. I want you to understand that Christ Jesus came as the door to heaven he is the open door who's ab absolutely standing at the door of your heart banging on your heart and he's asking you to come on into a realm called heaven from this day forward we don't want you to live under the pressure of earthly cares and earthly interests because i'm going to tell you right now it's a lot of storm it's a storm and when the lightning's going off and the thundering's going off and the wind is blowing really hard it demands some attention if you don't know how to say, I ah, don't worry about it, let's go sleep, let's just rest over here, can't work outside right now anyways. If, if it will demand your attention. If you've got, if you've got too much bought in and in your heart into the system and into the things which Satan uses to influence the decision and the desires of men, ultimately all that is going on around you will constantly steal away your affection it will steal away your interest it will steal away your time it will imprison you to the here and the now and you won't be liberated to live in the in the heavenly I'm telling you it's a wonderful moment in time when you get liberated to live in the heavenly because heaven is your home all you want is heaven you're constantly looking for Jesus and running wide open doing the will of the Father in the earth saying father glorify your name in my life I really wanted to sing that but getting everybody on page to do it on a key takes a whole lot of practice and time to put in it. And so, you know, we just, we just kind of have to let it go for right now. And uh, because it's something that everybody is going to have to be willing to do, you're going to have to be willing to, as it were, I don't want to use the word necessarily agonize, but it's got to be that desperate to your soul. I'm going to talk to you about a realm of believing. But it's a, and I think of it, by and large, what happens when people think about the realms of believing, they leave off some very essential ingredients to believing. 
And I think one of the most important things to the whole concept of believing is a passion. It's, 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 it's such a passion that it's almost like an agony. You've got to have it. You're so desperate for it. You're banging. You're asking. You're calling. You're so persistent. You won't let the judge give you any other answer. No. It's like you're coming, you're coming with this interest that I, I must have this now and I, I will not take no for an answer. God, even if you're telling me no, I will not take it for an answer. Somebody said, can you do that with the Lord? Oh, I have found that God loves that kind of persistence. Uh, he loves that kind of boldness. He's been working with us to bring us to that kind of belief, to believe how much he loves us, to understand how, how, how he has given us this right to be so emboldened before him that we can command ye me, says the Lord. Which is pretty radical. This is why men ought to always pray and not to faint. Because he's going to answer somebody who's not going to let up, who's going to continue to ask, who's going to be persistent about it, who's hungry, who's thirsty, who's always looking for their master because uh, so there's something far better to them than houses and lands and promotions and the affections of men and, and, and accomplishments in this earth. Something far more important to them is the return of their master. They, what, they, they, there's something far more important than, than their garden and their dreams and whatever else it is that they centered their life around, and it's the return of their master. God the Father wants to touch your heart and you live in a place here in the United States of America in San Diego where every lust of the flesh, where every care of this life has stolen away, has put its claws upon your time and put a claws upon and a claim upon the affections and desires of your soul. There's only one way to break free. You're going to have to turn it all over to Jesus. Whether you don't just, whether you get three or four hours of sleep a night, not because, yeah, hey, I know you're running wide open for you, but that ain't going to do you on the day. That ain't going to work out for you on the day. So if you, can't, if you can't let up on running wide open for you, then you're going to have to go ahead and lose out on more sleep because you need to run wide open for Jesus at the same time. If you're going to be bivocational, you know what I'm saying. I mean, there's going to have to be some time at a task here. Somebody said, what do I do? Well, one of the things you can do is you can begin to hit your knees, you begin to cry out to God like never before. You can begin to develop a prayer life that will ultimately cause a revelation of the power of God to you. A revelation of the reality of God to you <laughs> because there's never going to be the opportunity for these things to be manifested through you until you yourself have that encounter and father wants that encounter you just got to look at all the obstacles that are standing in the way things that have vied for your attention that has made claims on your affections that stand blocking the view Papa, we're just going to give you whatever we got left over. I'm going to tell you, if that's not religion, it's endangered upon the grounds of religion. It is, it's very close to it. So today, I'm going to ask you today, I, I want you to understand, I, I, we're, we're going to petition you on the whole issue of what do you believe about God? What do you believe? What do you really believe about God? What do you believe about who he is and what he wants and what he's commanded and what he's willed? What do you believe about the Bible and what the Bible says about God and what he's commanded and what he's willed and who he is and what he's doing and what he's purposed and what the plan that you find yourself right now literally caught in all of the obstacles and if you're not careful in all the cares and the details when reality of it is you and I are supposed to have a heavenly vision cooperating with a plan that's a much, much bigger picture than all the things that have to do with self-interest. What is it that you believe about what the Bible says? What is it that you believe about God? What is it that you believe about what the Bible says? And do they agree with each other? Because you may have a lot of ideas about God.
and what you believe about him. But I'm going to tell you right now, you're very limited until you've had an encounter with him. If all you're trying to do is read about him and conceptualize him within the confines of words and sentences and paragraphs <laughs> and chapters and books, but that is a definitely big beginning. I've got to ask you the question, what is it that you believe about God and what is it that you believe about his word and do they agree? Because I've run into a lot of good Christian folks that believe a lot of things about God that has no agreement whatsoever with the revelation of himself and his word. None. Well, 5%, 1% maybe. What is it that you believe concerning what God has said about you? What is it that you believe about yourself? And do those two things agree? Because I once again witness that, that there is even a, a contest, as it were, where Satan's trying to, he'll try to press me. I watch him press other men of God that I think have been used in great ways by the Lord and, and, and are still hungry to be used even greater, where Satan presses upon them their soul to try to get them to believe something about their self different from what God said about us when he made us a new creation in Christ Jesus and put us upon a road, a highway of divine purpose and glory to represent him. Now we're going to have to deal with this honestly because I'm telling you, I don't believe that there's this many people with ADD in the kingdom of God with this amount of ignorance and an inability to understand. I don't believe it. I believe Satan has worked his craft of deception to lure, lure people into a realm where that they're willing to justify a state that cannot be validated by anything that God has said in his word or very little, very little. Because I'm telling you, and I say anything cannot be validated by anything God says in his word because there's people who have turned so religious. I mean, uh, Ruthiana just got back from Greece and, and the Lord laid Greece heavily on her heart. Athens has been heavily upon my heart. It's been in prison in the Orthodox Greek religion. I've been asking the Lord, give me open doors for me so, Father, that I don't have to fight with religion, that I can go in there and reach the lost. Open doors for me with the Greek Orthodox Church so that they will give me a, a letter of permission. You know, and, and if we don't find our purpose in God, if we don't find our right to go and make disciples out of nations, if we don't find our authority that he's given to us in our inheritance, we will live lives conformed to this world and believe that we Holy Ghost feel baptized lovers of Jesus and all the time. There is absolutely, well, very little proof when it comes to superimposing our lives to the one that God described in his word, to the one that God described about us. Father's saying, I want you to be conformed to what I said. I want you to be, what you believe, listen to this, affects every dimension of your life. What you believe. And it, it, not only, it, it, it will affect every dimension of everybody's life. What they believe. What they believe about themselves. People, get, people come up and, and, and they're handicapped because of, dysfunctional homes and whatnot, and, and they just believe that they're, they're losers and they're going to be this and that and they can't ever accomplish anything, and ultimately they live out that ideology, that self-imposed caste system, that self-imposed concept and vision of their life, mm. that self-imposed bias. The Lord's come and talked to us in the most lofty words that you could possibly imagine, having empowered us with such an amazing inheritance. What part of his word are you unwilling to esteem him in such a way of honor that it's worthy of your believing it? It's the things that God has said, is it, worth, is, is it worthy of you believing it? 
I mean, is it worthy of you believing what God has said to the point that you would, with total abandonment, casting everything away, serve Him? Total abandonment. Huh? The Lord said, if you love a wife or husband or mother or father or children or the things in this life, you're not worthy of me. Well, how many people will actually line up with that? I've watched many people choose the things of this world and the things of their spouse and the things of family members above God over and over again. I've even come to people and said, you need to repent because you loved such and such a thing and followed such and such a person and whatever more than God. You need to repent to them because you don't recognize you insulted the Almighty. You come to him to honor him with worship, but in reality, it wasn't in truth, it wasn't in faith, and it was not an honor, it was not a war of worship, it was an insult. <laughs> you know what? It doesn't take many people to believe what I'm saying right now to change the world. It doesn't take many. Oh, it doesn't take many. And I'm going to tell you, Satan is going to fight against these words because these words are liberating. These, these words, this preaching, will break off the yokes that Satan has been able to put upon God's people and hold, hold the masses of those who have said they believed into a place of inability in him. So Satan will fight against this in every way because this is the only means for the yoke to be broken. And I'll be called harsh and unloving and insensitive and uncaring and mean and whatever else. Huh? Because Satan will fight that which ultimately is his complete destruction and power over the souls and lives of those who had clean escaped his power and his authority. That's the, that's the power of the name of Jesus. God's so loving, so merciful is this. You live your life for yourself and you live your life 23 hours out of a day for yourself. And then one minute out of that 23 hours, you call upon the name of the Lord and you say, Lord Jesus, he'll break the yoke right there at that moment and he'll give you 59 minutes to live for him if you'll, if you'll go ahead and utilize the whole 59. What happens is when things begin, when we allow things to play upon the affections of a heart, we can't ever sort it out. When we allow cares and interests to belong to the elements of this world, the God of this world, the power that is found within the, 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 the kingdom of the prince of the power of the air. There's no seeing this. There's no seeing it for what it is. There's no really grasping it for what God has to say. How many of the people from Israel really got it? Yeah, they saw the mighty signs and wonders. They trembled at the power of God when even Pharaoh himself was humbled. And that one who would be his heir that would be ultimately classified as a living God was killed that night on the Passover. <laughs> when they saw the Red Sea part, when they saw the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, the manna, but how many really got the inheritance because they were interested in garlics? What you interested in? They were interested in their spices and the food that they had to eat on the table. What are you interested in? People don't really believe this, but I'm going to tell you right now, there's too much taking thought for the food that you're going to eat. And Jesus said it's going to stumble you up and it's going to get in your way. And you won't be able to do what I want you to do. Now, I'm just going to tell you like it is. And you say, oh, but we've got to be responsible. Why isn't God worthy? to be believed why do you count him unworthy to be trusted because he's already said i'll take good care of you i'll take care of you but no 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 we come up with these great arguments of how we've got to be responsible and how that god has given us these particular skill set to do these things meanwhile he's doing very little measurably in the kingdom and a whole lot for you and your family Hopefully, see as you're wasting your life on you, I hope you're building a huge mansion and that you're capturing every possible luxury that you can have in this life. Because it'd be terrible to sell out for a penny, a silver dollar, a cruise in the Caribbean. What should a man give for his soul? And people say, oh, he sold his soul to the devil. That's why he's been so successful. And my question is, did you sell yours? 
Well, not to the devil. I need to sit down and make a bargain with the devil. Well, did you sit down and make a bargain with yourself? Did you sit down and make a bargain with the, the interest in this life only? Have you seen the beauty of God's plan? Have you been willing to step in to the beauty of God's plan? Be fashioned in His image, conform to His image, to live out he a heavenly life upon this earth. Pastor, I'm just, you just don't understand. I, I'm sorry I fell asleep in church. I'm just, just worn out. Well, what are you worn out? Well, job. Stuff at the, around the house. Parents. They need me helping them out over there. Go through the list. So we're going to sleep. Now it's time for you to sleep in your service to the Lord. Look, this goes on every day. It's going on all over the United States of America. Here we are sleeping in the moment of crisis, great crisis. We're sleeping in the moment of great peril. I know what's going on. I read the Bible. I understand what's going on. I see God's master plan. All this is happening. Somebody said, oh, it's a conspiracy. It's a master plan. I tell you, it's a master plan. Nothing's happening except the Papa allows it. Jesus has all power and authority in heaven and earth. Right now, Putin's standing uh, on the threshold of challenging all, the, all NATO. He's just, he's picking a fight. He just, we, he say, NATO's uh, trying to bark back at him like they rattle their sabers, like they've got some authority. And Putin's just basically saying, bring it on. I'm taking you out. I'm going to make Mother Russia the conqueror of all Europe. Watch, watch what I'll do. <laughs> right now, right now, Israel is being pressed, and I'd, I'd be leaving, and, and, and I don't see how that there's any way for them not to. Uh, but I'm believing they continue to go on and to go all the way. Somebody said, that's a terrible thing. No, that's a terrible world. That is a terrible world. That is a terrible world. It's evil. It's fighting evil. I don't know, and some good fighting evil and all this craziness going on, but I'm going to tell you right now, all I want is Father to have his will and have his way, and he says that kingdoms shall rise against kingdom, nations shall rise against nation, there will be war, there will be, and it will continue famine, pestilence, every wicked and evil thing, and it's going to come in such frequency as the day approaches, it's like a woman that's about to give birth to a child. I'm, sorry, I'm saying... Father, get this, let's get this thing moving. We had an opportunity to go into Iraq back in 2000, 2001. Now, Christians are being killed in mass in Iraq. An Iranian, Iraqi, Syrian alliance that has never even been thought of as being formed. People are gathering around the, 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 the everything that would stand against God on a scale. And, I, and I'm going to put anti-Semitism in that. I'm going to I'm, I'm put that as standing against God. I'm going to put standing against Israel as standing against God. There's folks that don't believe that. I'm going to put that right there in that context. Because it symbolizes, and though they aren't walking with God and doing what Father says, there's still a promise that God made to Abraham. See, when we think, you can't begin to be, talk about believing. What do you believe about yourself? What do you believe about yourself? Are you cursing yourself? Or are you blessing yourself? What do you believe about yourself? Do you identify yourself with, oh, I want to be like that guy over there who's really rich or really, really wealthy or who has this talent or who has that ability. I want to have this thing and that thing. Or do you want to rather conform yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ rather than being conformed to this world? What is it that you really truly believe about yourself? You, when you begin to think about this, you can't stop. You, you've got to immediately, almost instantaneously go to Abraham. You almost instantaneously have to go to Abraham. <clears throat> God comes to him and says, let me tell you about you. And he's like, wide-eyed, okay. Try to number the stars. Try to number the sea, sand upon the seashore. So I shall bless you, and, the, and, and your seed shall be like them. And he's standing there going, like a little child, like a little child. It's not going to argue, like a little child. He's standing there in the presence of the Lord saying, okay, that's okay, pray, thank you. And he considered none his own body. The scripture says right there in the context, he's there in Genesis chapter 15. He's standing there looking at the Lord. And the Lord said, I count it to you for righteousness because you believe me. 
You're going to believe what I'm describing about your life. Even though you're childish, even though childish, even though you beyond, you know, you if you were going to be this, you you should have started when you were like 14, and having children every year and having maybe like triplets. And by now, you know, you're like in your 80s, <laughs> maybe closer to 90s, 80s. You're in your 80s, and you're childless. And God says, this is who you are. And this is what I'm going to make you. And this is what I purpose for your life. People are sitting around in churches hearing God say, this is what I made you. This is what I purpose for your life. And they're not cooperating with God. They say, yes, it's true, but they don't in any way bring their belief about what God has said about them into a living practice, into an activity into a force, a power that is influential, a motivation that takes them ultimately into immediately cooperating with the plan of God. I, I, I said to the Lord, I said this morning, I said, Father, I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's fair. These people are sitting looking at me like a cow staring at a new gate, talking about these heavenly things that they have never seen you. And yet they're under the obligation to do what you said to do. And Father assured me, no man who seeks him should go away empty. Father assured me, no, 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 no. It's the condition of the heart that has to change. Don't tell me I'm not fair. It's the condition of the heart. I said, but Papa, look, they have no ability to even wrap their head around this. They are, imp they are under the load of the pressures of this life. And so was a great company of other folks that have lived before us. But they broke free because they had this passion on the inside of them that said, I will serve the Lord. I will believe what God has spoken concerning me. Listen, if all of a sudden, right now, you had a heavenly visitation, the Lord caused you to go under a deep sleep, and you saw... What was going on in heaven right now and recognized and he showed you on the map of his plan here's where you're at right now here's what's getting ready to happen now right here the next few days the next few years and here's what you're supposed to be doing you'd come out of that and immediately quit your job you would say anybody want the house take it i don't even care Whatever you want to do, just do it. Try to do it because I, you, nothing you're going to do is going to work on me. I found myself in the very center of the will and plan of Almighty God. I understand now what's going on in heaven that's supposed to be going on in earth. I recognize the series of events that are leading me right into a place of eternally reigning and ruling with Almighty God. True. So I'm going to back up again. What is it that you believe about God? Because I hear a lot of people got a lot of lofty words, got a lot of grandiose ideas, but they're not doing anything with it. There's no display of God's power in their life. There's no passion that drives them to the knees, that's calling them to cry out day and night. <laughs> that's, 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 that's so big to them that it's better than all the things in this world combined. It's the pearl of great price, a treasure that it is hid in a field, that they'll sell everything that they have that they might obtain it. Brother, we see something that we shouldn't see, that which Jesus described is a, a ground that can never produce that which Father has willed. Cares of this life. Holding on to my life. How about our future? How about our plans as a family? How about our financial plan? All the other things that, are, that, that impose themselves upon you here in a Western society, which you're about to lose, you better invest in heaven, which you're about to lose. Yeah. Listen to me. Everybody's all big and smart, huh? Got all kinds of insight till all of a sudden there's no food in the grocery stores. Then they didn't know what to do. But in God merciful and loving. A lot of people got a great, great ideas, great things that they're going to accomplish till all of a sudden that which empowers them to supposedly do all these things is taken away. Now what are you doing? 
Think about it, people. You don't have to go back too far in history to see what you're going to do. Because what makes you different from anyone else? What makes you different from any of the other millions in Israel who, is, who refused to honor the Lord, who refused to step into the inheritance, who ultimately provoked Father? I mean, you look at Deuteronomy 132 and you look at how things eroded from Deuteronomy 132. That whole concept of the Lord saying, I took you and I carried you as a child. A stubborn child who was one willing to follow me, who sat down in the dirt saying, I'm tired, I'm thirsty. I want meat. I'm tired of the man of fallen from heaven. To have such an encounter with God, ultimately, you would think everybody would immediately snap to and get right into the plan and purpose of the Lord, recognizing that the life is far bigger in expanse than just this temporal existence. The Father has us purposes for us and, 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 and place for us throughout the ages to come, of which now our decision-making at this moment in time has a huge impact. What we believe right now has a huge degree of impact on that. What you believe about yourself, you live. What you believe affects every part of your life. <laughs> Look at Abraham, his father of faith. He risked it all. He left his bank account, his house, his camel, camels, his herds, his security to go to a place of following the Lord. He cut himself off from the cares of this life, the seedfulness of riches and pleasures of this world. Will you do that? Now I have to come back and ask you again, what is it that you believe about God? What is it that you believe about what the Bible says? Now, do those two things agree? Probably not. Probably not. If I gave you a test, probably not. I'm sorry, P probably not. You're going to have to study a little bit more. You're going to have to study on the level of saying, okay, Father, whatever you say to me, I'll do it. Because then you're going to read something that you never read before. You're going to see things that you never saw before. Suddenly you're going to think, where did that passage come from? I been, must have been missing that whole chapter. In fact, where did this book appear? I thought I knew this book. No, you read it, you read it in a virtual reality. You read it as though it didn't apply to you. You read it as though it was an optional plan. You read it as though it was a smorgasbord and you could choose, it was a buffet, and you could choose what you wanted and leave the rest for someone else. Gotta be careful, gotta be careful. You're gonna have to come up with some serious, a serious theological plan for yourself to make you right. If you can take and choose and refuse <laughs> you can choose to refuse or take what it is you want. I hope I'm making you extremely uncomfortable. I hope you're starting to, you know, move in your seat a little bit. Huh? I want to deal with you. I want to, I want to uproot things that have been planted in there because the enemy came, sowed seed in God's field. Hallelujah. Yes. I'm going to ask you again, what do you believe about what God says concerning you? Now, what do you believe about yourself? Do those two things line up? Probably not. Probably not. So what are we going to do, Pastor? You've told us basically that we need, that we don't line up. What are we going to do? You're going to repent. You're going to repent quickly. You're going to repent because your days are short. Your days are numbered. You're going to repent quickly. And you're going to seek the Lord. People think that God's going to accept them into his kingdom with the smell of the world all over them. You stink. Too bad. He's not going to bring in you. Somebody said, oh, well, give him some time concerning me. He'll calm down. He won't be so anti-world. Just give him some time. I'm telling you right now, I woke up this morning with such an indignation against the spirit of this world and conformity to this world. I'm telling you right now, I am becoming, amen, there's, there's one other person that's got it here. I am becoming so intolerable to this world. I'm kind of, why, why, why? Because I've been having visitations from heaven and I'm seeing what Father, more clearly than ever before, I'm seeing what Father demands. People think that, people think that because he's so merciful and so, that he's so forgiving and that he's willing to instantly, you know, 
reaffirm you and bring you back in, that that then gives them the rights and the license to continue to live the life that they've been living. It's not. It's just mercy. Reality of it is, one day there, could, there will come the point where the Lord will say, no, 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 no. You never quit sinning. You never, you never was willing to take my mercy and grace and be transformed. You, know, you never was willing to be conformed to the image of the Son. You held on to your own life. You have to deal with this. I'm here to tell you, you have to deal with this. I'm here to tell you that you need to be crying out to God and saying, Lord, glorify your name in my life. Because we can easily say, oh God, glorify your name in all this world. And meanwhile, we're thinking, and God used somebody else to do it. Maybe we're not thinking it consciously, but what we're doing is we're abdicating, saying with no real buy-in, Lord, I recognize that you've got to have all of me in order to do that. It's like, Lord, glorify your name in all this world, but use somebody else. Lord, glorify your name in all this world. We're in the heavens and come down and do it so everybody can see that I've got the right belief and on the right side. No, no, no. Father, the only way he's going to glorify his name in all this world in this new covenant is that you first allow him to glorify his name through you. That is going to mean that there is going to be such a fear of God, such a holy indignation, such a separation from all that is in the world, from all the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, from no association with everything that is named in the 17 works of the flesh, everything that God himself is against, everything that Jesus Christ died at Calvary to save us from will become an enemy to you. That's where it begins. That's where it begins. Wesley said, give me a hundred men who hate sin. Huh? And are sold out to God and will transform the world. I believe it's still, that's the spirit of the Lord saying, still saying it today. Still saying it today. But Pompa doesn't have a hundred that are able to get together, it seems. Because I believe that's a true statement. I see it as a true statement of belief, a belief in the word of God. I see God doing that with 300 men liberating his plan that has been imprisoned by men's disobedience his plan imprisoned by men's disobedience liberating that for 300 men one man said look and he was a coward about the whole thing but he was not willing to be deprived of his inheritance and though the philistines had said you cannot eat of any of your harvest you got to give it all to us and then we'll give you back whatever we think you should have one man hid behind the shed. I don't know, maybe had his son watching while he threshed some of his wheat so he could make some fresh bread. The Lord saw one man unwilling to live without his inheritance, some of his inheritance, willing to risk his life to eat some of the bread that Father had given him in his blessing. And the, and the, and the, and the angel of the Lord appeared and said, O mighty man of God, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much. Man, I tell you right now, I was daydreaming of a plan for Japan this morning, man. I'm telling you. And I was seeing you in the picture. I daydream. I, I, I have daydreams. I, I have grandiose daydreams about taking over nations for Jesus Christ. I want you to have grandiose dreams of making disciples out of nations because that's exactly why Jesus said he ascended up in heaven and all authority was given to him in heaven and earth so that you and I in total abandonment of our life because you're never going to step into this. You'll, re, you'll, you'll recoil. You'll hold on to yourself at the moment. You won't even recognize that it is the day. It is the moment that now Father is going to allow you to step into a place of greater opportunity. You hold on to your life and you won't cross over. You're going to have to start practicing. Let go. Let go. Let go. And I just pr I praise the Lord for those of you, some of you who've been at least practicing coming here an hour at night for prayer. Praise God for that. <laughs> I'm looking right now. I've got to, you, listen, you, listen to me. Listen to me. The harvest is plenteous and the laborers are few. Somebody said, well, we went out and we worked all day and we got nothing. You don't understand. Father was training you. You were in the fiery furnace of faith. He was molding you. You were under the potter's hand. He was shaping you. Don't stop because he's, he's developing within you the capacity to step into a nation and confront the powers of darkness and every lying power of hell and liberate souls as you walk up and down the street, as you go everywhere preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, as you do the things in 
in obedience to God's plan according to His way of doing it. You measure the, you measure the results in a wrong way. Measure the results on the magnitude of obedience. Measure the results based upon you doing what God said to do in His Word. You're, you're, you're cooperating with what He describes you to be in your purpose. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Father isn't going to look kindly upon anyone who sits around counseling, patting people on the back and saying, oh, you're okay, it's all right. Did the pastor upset you when he <laughs> told you the truth? <laughs> I know he's rough. You're okay, just come over, come over to our house. We'll, we'll love on you and confirm you in your iniquity and your disobedience and your rebellion and your stubbornness. We'll support you in your defiance against the truth. I have many enemies today because they do not understand the call of God upon my life and my obedience to the heavenly vision. It doesn't matter to me. I just wish they would understand the call of God upon their life and become obedient to the heavenly vision and sell out as half as much as I sold out. I have many people who persecute me today because they don't know who I am in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter to me. I bless them. I just wish and desire above everything else that they would become radical for what they believe about God. I pray in Jesus' name that all of a sudden you will recognize that every day, at every moment, all throughout your existence, you're choosing whether or not Satan is your God or the living God, Yehovah, Christ Jesus is your God and who you serve. You cannot practice sin and not serve Satan. Cannot. Father, in his love and goodness and his mercy, immediately forgive you. Oh, Lord, forgive me. It's okay. Will you say no to it? I'll say no to it. Okay, I forgive you. It's amazing. It's amazing how he's empowered us. Be not, be not, don't be conformed to this world. But, but think differently about yourself. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be transfigured. <laughs> Changed. Transfigured. Hallelujah. Transfigured is a different word than changed. I've been changed. I accept what God has made me in Christ Jesus and what he said I am. And I bless me myself every day for being in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. I don't feel bad about myself because I'm under, I'm under the, I'm in the plan of Almighty God being shaped and prepared for ruling and reigning with him throughout the ages. I'm very happy with the potter's molding of my life. Hallelujah. Just so, all I'm going to measure is the level of obedience. Am I, where's my heart at? Is my passion with his passion? Is my desires with his desires? H have, I, have I set myself to doing those things which God has commanded me to do? I'm going to measure everything by my obedience to him, not any of the other. So, supposedly, you know, quantifiable results. How about the obedience? Because I'm telling you right now, the obedience is going to produce fruit. There's no doubt about, there's no doubt about that. But what's most important is the fruit of relationship, the fruit of relationship that is willing to just love Father and be loved by Him and recognize that wrongdoing is such an offense and such a grief to His heart. You never want to grieve Him or hurt Him. You love Him too much. You want to honor Him. He's dead. He's Redeemer. He's Savior. There's nothing that you hold on to in this life more valuable, more important than blessing Him, doing what pleases Him. I want to jump over to Mark chapter 11. Mark is so radical. Have you ever noticed how radical Mark is? He's radical. He's radical faith. Mark is radical faith. He's radical conform to God. If you are a believer, these miracles will follow you. Come on, I'm telling you. And it's challenging, it's provoking. This is, what you, this is what you're going to have to recognize about yourself. Huh? 
So when I recognize that I've been powered by God to do these things and he's worthy to be believed, huh? I'm not going to treat him as though I'm suspicious concerning whether or not he's told me the truth. Huh? Right? Or somehow this got held hostage by men. I, I believe that God is God and everything that is in the Bible is absolutely what he's described his will to be and purpose for me to be. And so when I hear these signs or miracles should follow them to believe, it just can't be any other way. It's not like I'm going to use that as a means by which I'm going to decide whether I'm right or wrong or whether God's right or wrong. I, I'm just absolutely sold out. This is what God's describing of me. Hey, see, your seed is going to be as the stars of the heaven and as the sand upon the seashores. Hey, see, if you believe in me, you'll cast out devils, speak with new tongues, take up serpent, drink any deadly thing, lay hands upon the sick. Come on. Huh? Then that's who I am because I say yes that's me I w unless you're converted become like a little child a little child you I, I, you know take little Anna just tell little Anna whatever she's like okay whatever I can do that Anna here's a million okay she didn't say that you didn't give me anything we call it make-believe The little, the little one really believes it. They're bought into it. They should convert it, become like a little child. You can't enter the kingdom of heaven. You can't participate with the kingdom. They are hungry and thirsty for the kingdom. Huh? You want to do these things of the kingdom. Well, you can't have the things of the kingdom and have the things of the, of the world at the same time. You can't have the toys of the flesh and the riches of the spirit. What, what, are you gonna, what is it? You can't have the pleasures of walking around in communion with everything that Father has made available. All those things that he's described when he said that we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. But you give your life as a slave under the taskmaster of your own lust. Huh? Trying to get ahead, I want to buy a house. I want to buy this, I want to buy that. Oh, yeah. Then you're living as though you die and it cease, you cease to exist. It's either that or you're just totally ignorant. Totally ignorant. It's either that or you're just totally deceived. Because if you saw the master's plan, and you're willing to believe the word that he's described in fully revealing that master plan, and he showed us in his word exactly where we fit into that master plan and exactly where we're at right now and what all he's made available to us. And as soon as you start reading the Bible as it's more important to you whether or not you get a good grade or whether or not you get a good job, I've really developed a different opinion about education over the past year. I've watched people's hearts be stolen by education as much as they're stolen by their own pursuits of jobs and this and one. Satan doesn't care how he's going to play his game. He's just going to steal you. He's going to steal you. I think for the rest of my life, I'm just going to send people to Bible school or the mission field. Somebody said it's not an accredited degree. Who cares? Who even cares? You live in like when you die, you cease to exist. Rather than recognizing that Father is taking you through this series of decisions, giving you opportunities to be molded and shaped for such a high calling and such a high position. What do you believe about God? What do you believe about the Bible? Do they agree? What do you believe about what God has said about you? Because the things he's described of who we are in Christ Jesus and what he's made us through this wonderful, glorious miracle of salvation sets us in a whole other realm of life. We have a whole unique criteria of what success is and what failure is in all the rest of humanity. 
somebody says, oh, I'm successful. I graduated from Yale with a PhD, then I went to Harvard and I got my MD, and then I went over to um, Berkeley, no, Stanford, got my law degree. I'm so successful. Yeah, by, by men's measurements, yeah. Oh, I started with just a small I mean, business with just a little bit of equipment, and now we're worth over 200 billion today. So what? In the framework of men's criteria, successful. Framework of God's criteria, fool. Fool. Vanity. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I do not know you. You have no place in my kingdom. So what is the measure of success? What is it that you believe? What is it that you believe about what God says concerning you and what is it that you believe about yourself? I believe that I am a new creation, that I am the tabernacle of the Holy Ghost, that I've been vested with all the power of Almighty God. I sit as a servant, I stand as a friend and as a co-heir and, 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 and co-laborer and inheritor of all that Jesus Christ himself has. Hallelujah. <laughs> to go now and preach this gospel no matter what it takes to stand and shout out things in the realms of the spirit that, has, that brings down the fortresses and the strongholds of Satan's iniquity over men. That I get to stand here in the fire where people refuse to come and listen, refuse to come and participate, where the principalities of this county say you can't have this property, you can't have this building. I get to stand here in the midst of all of this upheaval and all of this anti-God, anti-Christ stuff and say I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the water, I shall not be moved. I'll faithfully speak your word. I'll stand here, O oh God, and proclaim faithfully all those things which you've spoken to me and you've revealed in your word. I will not be moved. It does not matter. No, it does not matter what people do. It doesn't matter if it costs me my life. It doesn't I happily, I gladly, I've already surrendered and given it up. It's not my life. I was purchased by God. Do you believe that? I know you believe that God said that about you. But do you believe it about you? Because when you do, the opinions of men and the things that people say have no power, no impact on you, no power on you. The lies that Satan's constantly telling because he's telling many. He's speaking all of his propaganda. <laughs> no impact on you no more. You're a liar. Nothing to do with God's word. All these imaginations, which are the stronghold of Satan's work, which is the very focus of the power of God at work in our life to pull it down to stop it. <laughs> have way, those imaginations have way too much influence in your decision-making process because you sit around and you daydream, you imagine these things about yourself, these crises, these issues. You hear these voices that have nothing to do with what God described in His Word about Himself, about His will, or about who you are, and yet you believe it. And out of that believing and out of that fear and out of that concern and out of that ideas, you then begin to make choices and you begin to make decisions about living forever without God in your life about doing it your own way and promoting yourself as a deity that is to be exalted above the spirit of the living God. You better be careful. Papa's going to change this whole world. He's going to change it ultimately with fire. He's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. Father's about to change things radically now in this generation. Before I die, we will see a great outpouring, a great moving of God before I die. And because Father's raising up people that have no care for money. They have no care for whether they got a house or a car. They got no care for fine clothes. They got no care for any interest in this life. They are radically sold out to heaven. They are radical righteousness and holiness. They are radical purity and godliness. They are radical God's word, what God said, we'll die for it. Kind of, we'll live for it kind of people. He's raising them up. And these things that I speak out, and I've been speaking out now for 33 years, 
participate with that change. Participate with that work of God. Because there's a lot of other folks that are speaking the same thing out in the, all around the world. And that voice is going out and it's not returning void. It's accomplishing it, those things which God has purpose to do. It's sowing the seed. I would, I would say that you, when you look at Caleb and Joshua, their lives and their commitments sowed the seed for the next generation to be so radical. Whether we live or whether we die, we're not going to be like mom and dad. We'll do whatever you say to do, God. We'll not defy our leadership. We'll walk with them. It doesn't matter if we look like we're walking into certain death. Let it come. Come on. Father anointed 70 others also. So there would have been Joshua. There would have been Caleb. And then there would have been, if we excluded them from the 70, someone include, some exclude. Let's just make it bigger, 72. Let's put Aaron and Miriam and few others that I could name in there and bring it up to about 76 people preaching the word to millions huh hallelujah my life is gonna be radical testimony for sold out sold out sold out no tolerance for sin and iniquity. No tolerance for the things of this world. No tolerance for that demon power that would try to defy the works of God. No tolerance for demon doctrines that would justify the state of iniquity in the flesh. No tolerance. Because, oh, men have done, I understand, I understand what people are trying to say when they talk about the flesh all the time. But what they've done is all they, they've created for themselves a doctrine, an idea that would justify a state of never being an overcomer. Of never giving themselves to being sold out to living and walking only by the Spirit of the living God. <laughs> it's one thing when you recognize that the flesh is something that is, that is wrong and you don't want to have anything to do with it. But I take it to a higher level. I bring it right more and put it right more in your face. Yourself. You must deny it. I'm going to ask you this question. How many times did you deny yourself yesterday? How many times did you deny yourself yesterday to do what Father said to do? To be what Father said you were supposed to be? Huh? How many times? Think about it. I want you to think about it now. Because Father said every day, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And he's talking to us very specifically about losing our life to do the will of the Father, because that's what Jesus did. He came, Jesus came, he came and lived only for one purpose, to die for the purposes of God. Jesus Christ was born for one purpose, to die for the purposes of God. Hallelujah. He was born for one purpose, to live for the purposes of God and die for the purposes of God. People sit around and sing about, we're, we're uh, you know, this and where that and history makers and shakers and whatever. It's altogether a different thing to get out and do it. It's altogether a different thing to meet Satan right at the point of his temptation and take him out by the power of God. It's all totally different. One's living in a fantasy, huh? And the other stepping up to participate with the power of God that's been revealed to our life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I hate the devil. Everywhere I see him, I hate him. I hate him when I see people staring at me with that glare. I don't hate the people, I just hate the demon. Huh? I was watching that. I was watching CNN last night, just watching these guys come on, they put the camera on them. You know, you just, you just see, look at that devil. That guy's got a murder spirit, that guy's got a lying spirit. You can just see it. I don't have to be carried about by what everybody's saying. You know, God's given us discernment. We can look and see the demon spirit. Uh, you know, I just want to crawl through the TV and cast the devil out of them, you know. Everywhere I see the devil, I want to cast them out, except for in church. No, not really. You're not supposed to cast the devil out in church. You're supposed to just accommodate people. Huh? Accommodate them. So they'll come back. Why? So they'll come back so we can accommodate the devil more? So that then they'll come back again so that we can accommodate the devil more? And then ultimately get them in a self-justified state of deception where there's impossible for them to be saved? No way. No way. I'm going to cast out the devil. 
I'm going to get right in your space. Whatever your problem is, I pray in Jesus' name. I'm standing right in the big middle of your problem, jumping up and down on it. <laughs> Amen. Somebody say, well, why would you want to do that? So that you'd be saved. So that what you believe about God and what God says in his word about himself will line up. So that what God has said about you and what you believe about yourself will line up. So that you begin to recognize that everything that you believe affects every dimension of your life. And I hope that ultimately it will come to the place where the, the Lord says to you, just like he said to the centurion, be it, what, be it just like you believed it. Let it be just like you believed it. As you have believed it, that's what's going to happen. Well, do you believe I'm able to do this? Do you believe I'm able to heal you? And this is Papa's speaking through Christ Jesus over and again. Throughout the pages of the Bible. Are you looking at Mark chapter 11, verse 24? Are you there? Jesus tells us very clearly that when you walk in a place of faith, which is something that God empowers us to be. Notice I'm just saying this about faith. Folks, some folks want to make miracle faith different from salvation faith. There's no basis in the scripture to do that. The administration and the object or the working of that faith is different, but the faith is the same. There's only one faith. It's this wonderful th framework of that which is provided for us in a relationship with the Lord. Some people say, that it is literally the ancestor of love. Some people would say that it is the very source from which all other graces arise. I, you know, I understand what's being said there. I tell you right now, I, I may have a little bit of disagreement on the side of the love, but the bottom line of it is, it is something that everybody in this place needs to recognize that it is if it's not first, it's second. Huh? If it's not first, it's second. If you got first, you're going to have second too. Huh? Faith which works by love is really the only verse of Scripture that really stands out bigger to me than anything else, all along with the fact that God is love and that God is not faith. That's why I have a little bit of a problem with the theologians who want to make faith the, the ancestor of love. But the but, but bottom line of it is, when you've got God's love, when you're walking, in his, you're going to have his faith. When you have his faith, you've got overcoming power. When you've got, who, who you got his love, you want to do whatever it is he's purposed for you to do because the spirit of the Son's on the inside of you, motivating you and moving you with great passion and purpose to do everything that Father has willed. To hate everything he hates, to love everything he loves. Will you harden your heart today? Or will you soften your heart? To think about it, to consider that we actually have the ability to do that, to choose that. Harden my heart or soften my heart. Soften my heart because I'm going to be willing to say yes, Lord. Well, God, I just, I'm repent before you right now. God, I want everything that you purpose for my life, that's all I want. Just... I tell you right now, if I wasn't a preacher, and you know I was a person who was looking for a church, I'd go find a church with a preacher as fiery as me, or fi more fiery than me, speaking against sin and against ungodliness, a call to complete abandonment and total consecration to the will of the Father. And I'd sit in his church and listen to what God's saying. And every time I'd say, yes, oh God, oh yes, oh God, oh yes, yes, oh God, yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> Father's not willing that any would perish. He's made opportunity for everyone. But some of us are the prisoners of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you could count yourself in that number. Truly many are called, but few are chosen because few are willing to go all the way. Few are willing to step up and do what Father said. Few are willing to be champions. Few, few are willing to, to stand against fear and intimidation and all the other things that would distract us from the beauty of living this life in Jesus. Few. I pray that the few will be many in this place. Hallelujah. I just... 
I got one verse of scripture that constantly encourages me greatly. There in Revelation chapter 7, when there's this innumerable company of people, more than, no, more than anyone can number, standing there with the victorious palm branches in their hand. Hallelujah. But it come out of great tribulation. Do you find yourself in great tribulation? I do. I'm in the midst of it. You're not in great tribulation? Maybe you are acquiescing. <laughs> Maybe you're in great acquiescing. Acquiescing. Accommodating. Huh? Don't be that. Get over here in the great tribulation. Because you're standing against everything that is in this world. You're standing against all the powers and forces of hell. They're trying to stop the gospel from going forth. You're in the midst of the battle. I'm going to say this. You want, no matter where you're at and where you find yourself for the rest of your life, when, you, when God takes you to a ministry, takes you to church, makes you a part of a company of the saints, you want to be in total 100% agreement with them because you don't want to be found fighting against God. If there's anything you want to learn, no matter where Father takes you, you come into complete submission, you come into complete agreement with that authority there. Otherwise, you'll be found fighting against God. You want to get that right. You want to get that right. Because I want you to make heaven. You can make heaven not liking me. Now, Lord, I forgive you for it. But either way, I want you to make heaven. Then you'll find out when you get there who I am. And more than that, you'll find out when you get there who you are. And reality of it is the Lord's made an opportunity for you and I to find out who we are before we ever get there because we're already in Him and He's in us. But we just got to begin to walk this thing out. We'll find out we had, we were going, we were going looking for a dime and we had more gold than Fort Knox living on the inside of us. Huh? <laughs> we, went, we went scratching around finding a little piece of copper when all the time we had, had all the wealth that belongs to the ages. In our lives, heirs and joint heirs with Jesus. Come on, man. Come on. Let's try it. Somebody. Let's try it. It's time for somebody to get their blindness healed. It's time for somebody's hair to grow back out. It's time for somebody to stand up and begin to understand what it means to be more than a conqueror. To under somebody to understand what it means to defeat Satan at every point. Somebody at least that is engaged in the in the in the in the in the action. Of defeating Satan at every point. I write unto you, young men, because you're strong. The word of God abides in you, and you've defeated Satan at every point. Somebody engaged in that. He's purposefully living to obey that which Father has commanded to do, that which Christ Jesus has given us commission to do, to be that which He formed us and created in Himself. To live. Come on now. Come on, you can do a whole lot more than you're doing in the kingdom of God. Come on now. Come on now. Shake off those heavy bands that hold you, that confines you to the world, the spirit of this world. Shake off those things that would, that, that would hold you prisoner to self-interest. Come on, total abandonment. Let's go serve God. Come on, let's go walk with God. Come on, go find a nation. Go now to a nation. Go now. Ain't nobody holding you back. Go now into all the world and preach the gospel. Ain't nobody holding you back. Nobody around here trying to hang on to you. Get going. Prove God. See if he's not faithful. See if he won't take care of you and provide your, all that you have need of according to his riches and glory. See if he won't give you more uh, than you could have ever gotten for yourself. See if he won't. If you take no thought for what you eat. If you take no thought huh, for what you're going to wear or where you're going to stay, you step out in God. Hallelujah. See, Pokor Amaseya. Hmm. But first, get down on your knees and get baptized in the Holy Ghost and learn to walk in love and submission to God's rule and plan. Otherwise, you're going to get out there and face a whole lot more problems than otherwise you would have had to. Uh, why go and create problems for yourself? Why not just go ahead and learn? Just get an agreement. But I'm telling you right now, there's probably about half of you I'd send you out right tonight. 
Huh? People say, well, I'm going to leave the church. Why leave the church? Why are you, you going to leave the church? You know? As one preacher said, yeah, as folks came to me and said, uh, well, we're just going to leave the church because we just don't think you love us. And the pastor said, look, I know every pastor in this town, and I would really like for you to leave, but I just don't want to do it to them. <laughs> I, I just cannot abide seeing you go over there and cause them as much misery as you're causing me. No, you cannot go because those other pastors are my friends and I just can't do it to them. Because that's about what it amounts to. It's about what it amounts to. Because it's do nothing here and then do nothing there and cause problems here and cause problems there. And all you'd be is someone who is actually fighting against the kingdom of God everywhere you go. You don't want to do that. You stop that right now. I'm going to ask you one more time before I close here. What do you believe about God? What do you believe about the Bible and what it says about God? Do those two agree? What do you believe about what God said about you? What do you believe about yourself? Do those line up? If they don't, you're in trouble. If they don't, you're in trouble. How many of you in here today, you believe that God redeemed you, set you free, gave you every good, wonderful thing so that you can live your own life? Would you raise your hand? So that you can make your own choices, do wherever, what you want to do, go wherever you want to go, plan it out for yourself. Decide on a daily basis. No, God called you to deny on a daily basis all those things and obey what he said in his word. And come to recognize and come to discover that he's really empowered you to be everything that he's purposed for you to be, that he's described for you to be in his word. But you can only discover that when you're willing to deny yourself and obey him. You don't even discover it. Otherwise, it's just going to be theoretical. And I don't believe that people make heaven on a theoretical knowledge of God. I don't believe it. He's a relationship God. He's into a relationship. Seek God amasate. The Lord says, seek me. Seek me while I'm near. Seek me while I might be found. Call upon me while I'm near. You say, I'm going to wait till tomorrow. All you did was step in to the realms of the kingdom of darkness and say, handcuff me with your deception. Uh, tomorrow I'll do this and tomorrow I'll do that. Tomorrow's never going to come for you. Today you make the decision. Today is the day of salvation. To delay is only to imprison yourself with more deception. Everything that I'm saying, you will find out to be true one second after you're dead. Why wait? When there's so many proofs already that what we're saying, what this word of God declares is right. How much of the word of God, how much of the Bible can you disobey, disobey and be right with God? How much of the things that God has commanded and say, said can you ignore and be right with God? How much can you live a life that is wrong and not right and hear the Lord say, well done, my good and faithful servant? <laughs> Do you go to bed with that every night? I go to bed with that every night. Father, I want to live pleasing unto you. Lord, forgive me for every area in my life that wasn't well done. I pray, oh God, in Jesus' name, that you will strengthen me. Take hold of my life. I surrender everything to you. I hold nothing back, oh God. Take my will, all that I am. And make me everything you want me to be. Wake up in the morning and say the same thing. Because it's on me. I believe it. I want to hear, well done. That's success. That's success. That's it. That's all I want. That's the riches. That's all the inheritance I want. That right there is all the retirement plan I need. <laughs> well done. My good, my good, my good and faithful servant. There's four very powerful words there. Actually, you know, because I put well done as one. Well done, good, faithful servant. Is that who you are? That's who I am. I'm a good, faithful servant. Are you a good, faithful servant? If you're not, you better get to be one right quickly. Right quickly. Huh? What, Papa going to tell a lie? Huh? He's going to see you to be something that you're not? It's not true. He's not going to see you to be something that you are not. He's made us something that he is. Hallelujah. 
He's given it to us, uh, and he's come not only to give, us, give it to us, but to mentor us in us every day and establish us every day, but it's our participation. Whatever you believe about yourself, that's what you will become. What you believe affects every dimension of your life. People have taken a hold of this just in the secular world, to believe things, to have this positive thinking, to, have, to take on this, this demeanor uh, of success, and with it, they've achieved things out of just the human realm. And some out of a demonic realm with it. Uh, they stole it, they hijacked it from the church, they hijacked it from the plan of God. What do you believe? What do you believe about what God has made you? What do you believe about what God has purposed you? What do you believe about what God will do with you? What, do you, what is he worthy of? Is he worthy to be believed? Is he worthy of you believing what he said? Has he ever lied? Has he ever been unfaithful? Never. You, you can rise up right now and go conquer a nation. You can rise up right now. You can go. I mean, this morning I was imagining myself because I've been like, okay, Lord, how are we going to get Japan? How are we going to get Japan? How? And I keep waiting for the Lord to tell me how to get Japan. I'm not hearing anything yet. What do I do? Oh, he doesn't want me to go to Japan. No, I keep, oh, God, how are we going to get Japan? How are we going to get Japan? Because this is how you walk with God. How are we going to get Japan? How are we going to get Japan? How are we going to get Japan? Huh? This is how you walk with God. How are we going to do this? How are we going to follow? I mean, you try to imagine something, no, that ain't it. How are we going to get, how are we going to do this? I was imagining myself going from house to house, little church to little church, until I was an old, gray-headed man. <laughs> whatever, Father, I'll do it, I'll do it, whatever, whatever, whatever. Oh, God, use me. Oh, God, use us. Listen, this is going to become a passion of your heart. Just what, do you, what do you believe about God? What do you believe about the Bible? Do they agree? What do you believe about what God said about you? What do you believe about yourself? Do they agree? I'm telling you people, for the most part, those things are far apart from one another. You can't hand father your checkbook and say, are you impressed? You can't hand him a paid off mortgage and say, look, look, I got paid off my mortgage. You should believe upon me. These signs should follow them that believe on me. They should pay off their mortgage. These signs shall follow them that believe me. They shall have a serious retirement plan. These signs shall follow them that believe me. They'll have plenty of money in the bank to give to their kids to go squander on a life set on hell. These signs shall follow, look at what do we believe about what God said about us versus what we believe about ourselves? What do we believe about God? Versus what he describes himself and reveals himself to be in his word. I've said all these things to bring you to this one point. In Mark chapter 11, verse 24. Therefore, I tell you, and he's already, said in, or he's already said in verse 23, I'm going to tell you with absolute certainty, there's nothing impossible for you to believe. And he, and he described it as a mountain being plucked up and thrown into the sea. He says, therefore I say to you, what things, whatever you desire, whatever you desire, Whatever you zealous for, whatever you're passionate about. It's not like, oh, genie in the bottle, may I now have a pumpkin pie. Just whatever, you know, new idea pops in your head, you're not really, you're not, you know, it's not passion, it's not a desire. Is it a desire? It's a passion. I gotta have this. I gotta have Japan. I gotta have this. Huh? I got to have a greater display of the power of God revealed in my life. I got to have it. I have it. It gets released whenever it's tapped on. It, it gets re I have it. But I want a greater display of it. I want a display of it on the level where people are being raised from the dead. That's what I want. I want, I want on a display uh, 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 where the ministry of Jesus Christ is fully revealed 
not with 10, 20, 30% of the people getting healed, but everybody in the whole place, whatever the problem is. I got to have it. It's not like, oh, well, you know, you know, if the Lord wants to do that in my life, you know, that's fine, you know, but I'm really, really busy right now. But, so, Lord, you know, if you want me to do that, let me know, because I'm available. It's not, there, we're not even talking about this, because this desire thing is a passion. It's a great zeal. Here's what I'm telling you. If you're passionate about it, if you want, you want to pray like Jesus prayed, you want, you, want to, you want to move like Jesus moved, you want to function like Jesus functioned, look at the passion. Look at the dedication. Look at the zeal. We've got to all allow, allow the Holy Ghost to examine our heart about how we have too much of our time and interest set on things that have no value. And we've got a lot of zeal to do it. The labor that people put in to accomplishing their goals for their own fame and fortune and purpose. Give me a break. Stay up late at night trying to get it all done. Get up early in the morning. Meanwhile, there is no passion or pursuit for the things of the kingdom. And then we write and we call ourselves right and we're upset at the preacher for saying that we're wrong. Don't stone the messenger. Don't argue with the messenger. Go argue with the papa. Go argue with the boss. I walked into the place where we were staying, and they had a, a driving range. I said, and I came down. Nice shirt on, but I had on my university warm-ups. And I said, could I go get some balls? And <laughs> they said, wait, no, it's against the rules. I said, it would, would it be possible to slide on the rules just a little bit on this one? I'm only going to stay 30 minutes. I've got to, I'm, I'm on my way to a meeting to get a little exercise. She said, well, let me go check. She went back. She talked to the boss. She came back out. She said, no. Am I going to stand there and argue with her? Oh, you, I'm going to tell her how bad she is, how wrong she is, how insensitive she is, how uncaring she is. It wouldn't even matter. She's just a messenger. Talk to the wrong person. Go back there and talk to the boss. Don't talk to me. Talk to Papa. Tell him he needs to alter his word. He said it wrong. It doesn't accommodate you. This doesn't fit into my life, God. This don't fit. This don't fit into my life. It ain't right. Do you think he's going to buy that? You think he's going to believe that? You think he's going to change everything to accommodate you or me? Could you believe that for a second? Huh? Are we that dull? You're not changing nothing. The only people around you are going to change you and me. You going to change? You going to change? Yes. You going to change? Yes. You going to change? Yes. You change? Yes. Might as well confront me here this morning and get it right because you're going to confront my elder brother very soon. And he's relentless. He's severe. He's unbudging. He's unmoving. Talk about the letter. He's got the letter. And the spirit. That's why Paul said, knowing the severity of God, We come to persuade men. It, father's going to have it his way. You think that's a bit selfish? Doesn't matter what you think, he's going to have it his way because he's right. Amen. It'd be selfish if he wasn't right. And you were right. Then you could say it's selfish because it's a competition, it's him versus you. But he's right. He's right. Every one of us are wrong. He's right. And if you understand that, then you're going to conform to what's right. Amen. And you're going to recognize, I can't do it my own way and be right. You can never make a wrong right. You can never make something bad good. Never. It's just that simple. Hallelujah. Therefore, I say to you.
Therefore, I tell you this. Whatever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them. Relieve that you receive it. That's a relationship, isn't it? Boy, isn't that a sense of being right? Boy, isn't that a confidence? My, isn't that a boldness? My, isn't that in, wow, a place and position with God that is like no other? Nothing's impossible for them to believe. I really like the next verse because when you stand praying, see, a lot of people, they just always kneel down. They got their legs cut off from underneath them. Huh? When you stand praying, you, you're asking God for something you're ready to go do. Huh? Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> it's a utabai ishike ramante. Ilipitu ramahase. Halaki and akushte. See, what happens, we ask God to do things in our life, then he empowers us. And, we, and when I'm up on the platform or out in the jungle or out on the street, I'm not asking God to do it. I've been empowered to do it. I'm telling him what's going to happen. Moon, stand still. Sun, don't move. I'm, you know, it's now time to, to, to move in the authority that he's given. Hallelujah. I stand praying, oh God. You see this war. You see this battle. You see how Satan's saying... San Diego cannot be changed. You see how Satan is declaring Southern California is mine. It belongs to me. You see, oh God, the forces of ill all around us and the battles that we are engaged in. You see, oh God, how that Satan is scattering men and setting men one against another and how the Satan lies against the truth and gets the anointing and people without just cause lay a charge against you and you're anointed. Without just cause, the only charge you can lay against me is that I told you you were wrong and showed you how to get right. That's the only charge you can lay against me. You can't say that I didn't love you. I wouldn't lay down my life for you. You can't say that. And all you can bring proofs of that I said you were wrong and that you need to get right. Dear people, Jesus is calling you. How, in, how is there ever going to be a movement, a Holy Ghost movement, unless people will begin to cry out to God and repent and weep passionately, saying, oh God, I sell out to you. Oh God, to do thy will, God, that's all I want to do. Begin to cry out and begin to bring petition before heaven for this, for this nation, for this region. What God's going to do is not going to happen in the big churches with lots of numbers of people. It's going to happen like it always has happened in the small churches with desperate people who've worked through all the strife and the envy and the ugliness of humanity and demonic influence to break into the freedom of love and unity and togetherness and being a part of the body. Because verse 25 declares it very clearly. You can't have this kind of relationship and this kind of faith when you stand praying if you have unforgiveness towards anybody, if you have malice towards anybody, if you've spoken evil of anyone, if you have slandered anyone with your lips, if you've brought a charge against God or His anointed, if you've broken covenant in any way. Listen to me. The church, the early church described it like this. Jesus described it like this. Paul described it like this. Peter described it. If you break covenant relationship with the community of the church in any way, you, are, you have broken covenant relationship with the Father. You cannot have this faith in this relationship. Now, look around you and see a migratory church. It's a migratory church. A problematic, strife-driven church migratory church people unhappy with everybody else uh, that's got to stop somewhere it's got to stop why don't we stop it here why don't you understand who God is 
Why don't you understand what it is he revealed about himself and believe what he said in his word? Why don't you believe and embrace what he said about you? So that you will also believe the same things about yourself. Because I'm telling you right when, now, when you do, you all of a sudden, immediately, you've got the body of Christ emerging. You've got the church moving. Hallelujah. Father wants you to move mountains and hindrances out of the way. He doesn't want you to create them for yourself. Everything that you do that is opposed to God and outside of the divine will, well, ultimately, you will be found participating with demon spirits that are literally creating hindrances for yourself, literally creating curses against yourself, literally, literally creating mountains and obstacles to defeat you. You're not right. I'm not right. God's right. It's for you to bow. It's for me to bow to what he said. And I've come declaring what he said. I've come making it known. I've come today here just once again. Get in the word. Study the word of God. But study the word of God in a different way. Study the word of God that everything is in the word, you're going to go and do it. Everything is in the Bible, you're going to go do it. Because that's the heart the Holy Ghost will talk to. That's the only special glasses you need. Now you're able to read. Hallelujah. Because all you're doing now is getting instruction. Huh? I'm ready to do it now. Father, I know it's taken me a long time. I've been here for 50 years, but I'm ready to do it now. And here's the beautiful thing about Father. Good. Let's get her done. Let's do it. He's not like, you know what? I, you know, uh, you no. Know, no. No, you, no. You, you just dilly dallied around too long. You're just not that way. He's amazing. Right now, there's probably 400 million orphans. The people that, aren't have, that don't have enough food to eat, literally, in this world right now. Probably close to 2 billion. All of those people can easily be reached for the kingdom. Just go feed them. Go feed them. Go feed them. Go clothe them. They'll be reached. Easy. How many, how many is worth your attention? Do you need 10,000 for it to be worth your while? Well, then I ask you, ask you this. By what do you value your soul? How much are you worth? Then can you add the same worth and value to those souls? Could you go reach one person? Could you go reach one? There, there, there's a lots of folks. There are people that are hungry all over the place for relationship with God, to see the power of relationship. They don't want to hear you talking bad about somebody in the church and telling somebody why you don't go to church over there or talking bad about God's people or God's preachers, Benny Hinn or anyone else. They're just fed up with it, man. It's like, do, do whatever it is you do, man. Leave me alone. Are you with me? People, people are hungry for truth. And people are hungry for reality. They don't want to know your religion. They don't want religion. The world's filled up with religion. People are looking for truth. There's a lot of people everywhere looking for truth. What are you asking the Lord for? I'm asking him for the world. I'm asking him for the soul. I'm asking him for the heathen, for my inheritance. Because I'm here with Jesus and the Father has given him the heathen. He says, sit here at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Hallelujah. In other words, till I put your foot upon their neck. As Joshua said, come on over here, guys. He had the five kings. He had thrown them in the five mightiest kings of the nations of his day. He had thrown them in the cave. He said, bring them out. He said, come over here, captains. Put your foot on each one of their throats. So the Lord shall do all the nations, the same to all those nations that would stand against you. That's us. We're going everywhere, conquering us too. And I'm crying out to God, Father, give me the nations. Father, I thank you for the power to go feed them, to go clothe them. 
Some of you say, oh, you need money. You need faith. You need to get up and start moving in the power and the signs and wonders of God. You need to get out of, off of, one, as one brother said, your blessed assurance. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's true. And there's other people not even, they don't even have blessed assurance. You with me? They're not on assurance. Huh? They're living on borrowed time. Borrowed time. Father, in his mercy and grace, extends it out just a little bit longer for you to get it right. Borrowed time. There's a world in need, desperate. And there's only one provision, provision for them, a life changed by the power of God and filled with the Holy Ghost to, to, to do it the way the Father has commanded it be done. This, see, feel, you feel that revival? See, there's a revival spirit here right now. See, there is a sweeping Radical, earth-shaking, soul-changing feel and anointing right here, right now that will conquer the world. That will bring in the masses into the kingdom. You know, so when you stand praying, whatever you ask, Father's going to do it. If you believe that you receive it. So I say to the Lord, Father, raise up, according to Jesus said, as Jesus commanded, Father, raise up laborers for the harvest. Then I say, Lord, raise me up. But then I'm going to qualify how he wants to raise me up. Lord, the only, one you, the only way you want to raise people up is with mighty signs and wonders and demonstration of the Holy Ghost because they've been baptized in your glory and in your fire and in your person. So raise me up with your might, your power, your strength, your divine glory, oh God, raise me up. Just send me, oh God, just send me. Send me. Send me. Send me, oh God. Send me. Now see, see that faith can't really, that passion, that desire can't be there when the things, the cares of this life got you. Yeah. Okay, you know, cares of life got me. That desire, that passion can't be there, so it ain't going to happen. But when the passion's there, when it's, when it's there, it's, it's in your voice, because it's in your heart. It's something that's there. It's, the, the terrifying reality of it is upon your face. Because it's your life. It's different. And that's what we're going to do. Amen. It's not a matter of, that from that point on, it's not a matter of if, it's when. Huh? And it's this continual ongoing asking. It's this continual ongoing seeking. It's this continual ongoing knocking. It's this continual ongoing petitioning. It's like the widow who comes to continually weary the judge. This is what my men ought to always pray and not to faint. Luke chapter 18. <laughs> Huh? We, all, we see the circumstances, we see the situation with the boisterousness of the wind, we see the boisterousness of the waves of the water, and we begin to sink. And then I'm not seeing anything. I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus. I'm going I'm to I'm I'm see the heavenly plan. I see where I'm at right now in the heavenly. I see where I am on the timeline of eternity. I'm not going to spend one second in hell. I'm going to spend every moment of my life in the kingdom of God starting now. Huh? I'm not going to have demonic demon breaks. Huh? I'm not going to have communion with hell breaks. Huh? I'm not going to have uh, a breaks to, for the lust of the flesh and the lust of the, I'm going to go everything with God because everything that he is, I want. And everything that he doesn't want is only death and damnation to my soul. I've got enough wisdom. I hope you have enough wisdom now to start walking with God. And depending upon the Holy Ghost who will keep you and present you faultless if you'll depend upon him. Hallelujah. There's promises with God that are absolute, and there's promises of God that are conditional. There's two categories of God's promises. You need to know the difference. Yes. People really need to deal with the difference. Hmm. Indolible security. Don't be stubborn anymore. Don't make up excuses. Listen, don't make up excuses. You listen to me. People can self-justify real quick. It's a state of deception. You can talk yourself into deception inside of five seconds. Believe it. I said you can talk yourself into deception inside of five seconds. Quit communing with yourself. Uh -huh. Start listening to the Word of God. Come under the authority. Come under the uh, rule of His Word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. say. Oh, come, rule over me, shepherd of my soul. Bishop. Bishop is the one that tells me every move I'm going to make. 
The bishop's the one who has, it, it, uh, as it were, a kingly authority over you. He's bishop of my soul, shepherd of my soul. Hallelujah. There are no bishops today alive. I'm just kidding. But nonetheless, <laughs> he's bishop. Say nothing's impossible. So long as I keep my heart right with God. See, if I stand there praying and I have awe in my heart, if I have any kind of unforgiveness, I'm going to work. You've broken covenant relationship in the Christian community. You've broken covenant relationship in the body of Christ. Huh? I've had, there's been many people that left out of this place, had great calls of God upon their life. When they left, they left with a bad attitude. I said, I told them, I said, you're not going to do anything in the kingdom of God. I, I've even had, People that the, where they go to churches and the pastors come and talk to me and say, you know, the fine they can go anywhere they want to go. My my concern is is this great call of God upon their life they're never going to fulfill it. And then the pastors look at me, oh yeah they will. How how can you violate the word of God and say that, it, that somehow that it's going to work out if you don't repent? And I mean that's some of those cases were you know, 29, 30 years ago. Some of those people don't even walk with Jesus anymore. But they were so right when they left. They were so, you know, being controlled around here. I can just see. You, you, okay. Has anybody noticed how controlling I am? Huh? Just notice how controlling I am. Amazing. What a unique definition of control. I come in here and I stand here and I tell you what to do. But it's not my words. It's my father's words. Thus, he's in control. And I stand here today petitioning you, begging you. Show me where I'm declaring to you something of my own mind and of my own will. Show me. I'll repent. Show me. I'll repent. Show me, I'll repent. I'm declaring to you the word of God, moving in his mercy. If I was father, my goodness gracious. I, I'll tell you right now, if I was the keeper of the house when it comes to worship and people acting like they do, I'd start throwing people out, out of here. Out, you dishonoring the king, out. You dishonoring my master, out. Huh? You understand my passion. Do you have a passion? When you, therefore, whatever you have passion about, what you desire, where's your desire? I was telling a person the other day, I said, you know, we were talking about an event that happened. I said, yeah, you know, I said, I'm really easy going. I'm, you know, the Lord's given me the capacity to forgive. Have mercy, you gotta, you gotta have that capacity if you're gonna be a pastor, anyways. Because I mean, you're the target. You're the people that, that everybody's gotta disqualify if they can continue to live the way they've been living. The only people that are not gonna disqualify me is people who wanna change. That's it. That's the way it works. So you gotta have the capacity to be able to be forgiving. Because God's gonna demand change. You're gonna, you're gonna, somebody says he's gonna accept me as. I am. No, he's not. <clears throat> Father's not going to accept you as you are. He will not. Absolutely not. Not one single verse of scripture in all of the Bible or anything revealed about God says he's going to accept you as you are. He will not. He rejects you as you are. He changes you to be like him. He's giving you the power to be changed. He's giving you the grace to be changed. He's giving you the mercy to be changed, to be just like him. He's not accepting you as you are. And then he demands you to be conformed in every way to the image of the Son. He demands it. He demands it. It's not an option. He demands it. It's his command. It is his revealed, absolute, sovereign will. You must change. You must change. That's what he says. Be not conformed to this world, but be transfigured by the renewing of your mind. He demands it. He demands the change. Hallelujah.
demands that we in every way be conformed to the image of the Son. It's his plan, predestinated plan. And all of his ministers demand it. It ain't about people who made church about the success of church about total numbers. Total numbers, how, how well you accommodate people. How well do you accommodate, accommodate people? You describe for them how that their life in this world is okay. The more, the more you make their life meaningful and acceptable to God as they are living, the bigger your church can be, the more happy people are going to be with you. I'm going to go back there. I felt so good. Isn't that wonderful? He told me that Jesus loves me like I am. And that I said, I'm fine to live the way I'm living, and it's all, all good. Hananiah, God did not send you, neither did he speak through you. You caused these people to believe in falsehoods and made them to rest with your lies. Does God still talk like that? He does. That's Jeremiah, but he still talks that way. We're call, God's calling, he's calling you. Those of you that are standing, sitting here, those of you that are watching on the web right now, those of you that are watching this by YouTube, God's calling you. Huh. What are you going to be? Radical and passionate for God or just another religious no account? Sitting in a church somewhere. What are you going to do? You're going to be like Jesus? You're going to follow Jesus? You're going to follow men? Huh? You're going to walk in the spirit of the Lord? Huh? Are you going to walk in the spirit of men? What are you going to do? Huh? What are you going to do? Are you going to give yourself to learning how to love passionately? To bring no charge against God's elect. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But with all authority, rebuking, reproving, correcting, instructing, so that men may be thoroughly furnished given the ability in every way, complete in every way. Come on, people. It's time we turn this thing upside down. It's time we cry out to God till heaven's rain falls upon every soul. It's time the people of God begin to rise up, give him no rest until he raises you up, hallelujah, to go into the harvest with a sharp sickle, hallelujah. Amen, Gile to go bring people into the kingdom so that they become just like Jesus because you just like Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, you, and you're the model of their life because the power of God was revealed to them through your life. And nobody can accuse me of being anything but radical. And nobody can accuse me and be right. You can't accuse me of being anything but radical. And I love it that way, and I'm going to keep it that way. Amen. Praise Amen. God, Jesus. Amen. I'm going to become more fiery, more yes. radical. Amen. Yeah. I'm not going to allow myself to be accused of being lukewarm for one moment. Hallelujah. I'm not going to allow myself to be accused of being political for one moment. Hallelujah. And I say, come follow me as I follow Jesus. I, I petition you. I challenge you right now. Challenge you. Not to a foot race. I challenge you to come be radical and on fire for God. I, I challenge you. I challenge you. Hallelujah. Fakarasiki Prataya. I challenge you to come stand against the powers of darkness and the wiles of the enemy. I challenge you. I challenge you to come stand alongside Jesus. Uh, to be in the company of Almighty God. I challenge you. To come stand up here and not break ranks ever again. I challenge you. I challenge you to see yourself as Joel's army. I challenge you to believe these things about yourself. As God described them concerning his 12 and the 70 others also. I challenge you. I challenge you to surrender yourself and give yourself over to the purposes of God as the 120 did that were there on the day of Pentecost. I challenge you. I challenge you to be passionate and persuaded as Cornelius' house was. I challenge you to go and preach the gospel like Philip. I challenge you now. I challenge you to go everywhere doing those things that the early church did, behaving yourself with this kind of response that they had when they took their possessions that they, that they had, sold them, came and laid them at the apostles' feet because the apostles were in charge. Challenge you to make somebody in the kingdom of God in charge. Challenge you to be led 
by those who are anointed of Christ Jesus. I challenge you. Hallelujah. I challenge you to stand up big. And I tell you, I speak by Christ Jesus. I speak in Christ Jesus' stead. I speak by the Spirit of the Lord. I'm telling you from Father's heart. It's Papa saying, I challenge you. I challenge you. Come, stand in this company. I tell you. People get to praying. People get to crying out to God. People get to be passionate about these things. Moving mountains out of the way. Receiving everything that they ask. And it might, like, it might sometimes might seem like nothing's happening. You can look, go back in the history of the church. You can go back and look through the Word of God, and it seemed like nothing great was happening. But then all of a sudden, in an instant, in a moment of time, suddenly the power of God began to move, and everything was changed in a day. In a day. I'm going to say this for you folks. Things can change radically for you today. In a day you were born, and in a day you'll die. Death will come upon you suddenly. Death never comes as, well, I'm ready to go now. I'm just lay down here and die now. Today, what do you have to present before the King of Kings? Do you have an offering that's a whole offering, perfect offering? The offering that he's required of yourself? Or do you have an offering that's a lame offering? An offering of the leftovers? Not the first part, not the best, but the leftovers. Father said, I won't receive it. That's what he said. Again and again and again. From Genesis to Malachi in our Bibles, from Genesis to Second Chronicles in the way it's organized in the Hebrew Bible. So go and give that kind of offering to your boss. Go tell your boss how, you know what, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to be here, get the paycheck, you know, the benefits, but listen, you know, when I'm here, you know, I've got other things to do as well. You know, so don't be surprised you're going to find me often on Facebook. <laughs> You'll find me regularly texting, talking to various people, because I have a lot of people to talk to. Got a lot of things to deal with at the house. You don't understand. You don't understand my life. You don't understand what I'm having to go through. I'm going to tell you right now, the boss is going to say, you can leave now. He's going to say, you don't have to go work somewhere else. I ain't going to work around here. When you're here, you belong to me. And most people are going to go, yes, sir. Yeah, they're going to bow. They're going to bow. Yeah. They're going to bow. Now, what are you going to bring? You're going to bring what your boss would reject to the Father and expect him to accept it? That's what he said in Malachi. That's exactly what he said in Malachi. He just set it up a little differently. He said, go to the governor and bring this offering to the governor and see what he's going to do. He's not going to accept you. He's going to despise you. He's going to tell you, out of here, and don't you ever come back. I don't want to see you no more. You have no right to be around here. Uh, well, along with a few other things, I was going to say. <laughs> Who said that? Malachi? God said that. You can say, well, that doesn't apply. I hope that works out for you. But I'm going to tell you what I say. It does apply, and it means you, need, you and I need to conform right now. It does apply. It does apply. And when you get to heaven, I guarantee you, the Lord's not going to say, you were too radical, you served me too much. You didn't hold anything back. You went all the way. You took both testaments that were valid and important. And it just, it just wasn't right. So depart from me, you work with me. He's not going to say that. He's not going to say that. And everybody knows that. Let me tell you what people are looking for right now. Are you ready? United States of America, Japan, everywhere. Let me tell you what people are looking for. Listen to me. Religion will fight against it. 
The status quo of the church will fight against it, but I'm going to tell you what the lost are looking for. They're looking for a radical display of relationship with God that is completely committed, sold out, and authentic. That's all that God's made them hungry. And the spirit of the world and the force of hell has tried to get everybody, everybody to accommodate this status quo, this radical about nothing. It ain't worked on me, but I'm going to tell you right now, it's been a force to fight against. It's been a formidable foe. And there's a price to pay. But things are changing now. Things are changing. Things are changing. Things are changing. I'm hanging on to this place. We're fighting in realms of spirit. We're fighting. We're fighting for this property. We're fighting for this place. Because things, the way things are eroding right now is so, is so critical to me. This is, this is not make-believe. This isn't fear. Because I'm fine, man. I can survive in the woods. No problem. I know exactly what to eat. I can get it. And then problem. My concern is for you and for the people of the city in this region, this county. I'm not here for me. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. I'm here because Father loves you so much. He sent his only begotten son to you, and he sent me to you. Father's raised up ministers all over the earth. He sent us to you. He sent us in his stead to you. I'm holding on to this place because I really believe that this, our nation and the situation that we find ourselves in right now, internationally, is at the crisis mode. And then I see this place as a, as a center where we can help a lot of folks, just feeding them, taking care of them, giving them help giving them first and foremost the life that is in Christ Jesus, giving them basic essentials. The say sown against gang violence and everything else that's going to go down. It's getting ready to go down. It's going to go down. And you're going to be right in the big middle of it. And you better have yourself enough oil to make it through the midnight. Better have yourself enough oil to make it through the night. You can't make it now, you're not going to make it then. I believe many people will come into the kingdom during that. I do believe that. But I believe that people sitting around ready to commit adultery with the people who come in are ready to take the women and make, make them into fornicators because they don't have a love for God nor for a love for people because when you love somebody, you're going to protect them against sin. I'm not going to lust after you, I'm going to protect you. Huh? You're going to fall down dead in this revival. I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to fall down dead. You're going to wake up in hell. And somebody said, well, that's not grace. It is grace. It is grace. The grace message that people are speaking right now, that some of these people are, are, are out there uh, declaring was true, there'd be no Ananias and Sapphira. It wouldn't exist. Huh? I can go on with a long, long list. Maybe the time to change. It's time for you to change. God's going to, Father in His mercy is going to reach the lost. Father in His mercy is going to reach the lost. All you got to do is be willing to cooperate. And you don't have to talk Him into nothing. Are you with me? Yes. He's the one forms you. He wants to form you, prepare you unto every good work. He wants to form you and prepare you unto every good work. And I'm talking to a lot of people in this place here today. You want to be formed and you want to be prepared. I, I feel like most everybody in this place is that way. You want to be formed and you want to be prepared. Is just that you've not known how to stand against the powers of darkness. You have no ability to stand. And, and Father's going to give you the ability if you're willing to listen. You're going to have to conform. You just got to listen. You can't be stubborn anymore. No huh? You can't break ranks. You need to get in tight. You need to be saying, oh, okay, what'd you say? What do I need to do next? What, would, what, what, what is it that I need to do next? You need to get in tight. Instead no. of thinking you know what to do. You don't know what to do. It's a fantasy. You don't know what to do. You don't know what to do any more than if somebody plops you down in the middle of a war. You don't know what to do. You're going to have to learn. And that's why we need the Holy Ghost every step of the way. And I know the people who follow the Holy Ghost. I know them. They follow the leaders of the church. It's the way it is. You can't follow the Holy Ghost and not follow the leaders of the church because that's fundamentally what the Holy Ghost is going to teach you to do. 
People say, oh, I got a relationship with God on my own. You ain't got nothing. You got an imagination and a deception. That's all you got. Because I'll ask you one more time. What do you believe about God? What do you believe about what the Bible says about God? Do they agree? What do you believe about what God says about you? What do you believe about you? Do those agree? Me? I no longer live. My life is hid in God, in Christ Jesus. For me to live is Jesus. I'm the temple of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I'm a new creation. In my boast. Old things pass away, everything's new. I've been made the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. In this wonderful grace that God has given, I've given, given I have true righteousness and true holiness. A clean escape from sin. Hallelujah. Greater is he that is me than he that is in the world. I've overcome them by his word that abides in me, by his presence, by his very life. Jesus here in this life. Jesus manifested in my mortal flesh. Amen. I'm in him. He's in me. Same glory Father gave Jesus. I have right now. Give it to me as a free gift. I was talking to a man the other day, and he said, he said something to me right off the bat, like, you know, what's your vision or whatever. What's, and I said, well, first of all, I said, my name is Mark. Who are you? And, and uh, he said, well, I thought you were going to say you just want to be everything that Jesus is. I said, I already am. God gave me that as a free gift. That's what I believe about myself. What do you believe about you? Are you trying to be worthy? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Unworthiness, I know it's somewhat counterintuitive, but all it is is indication of pride and ignorance. I'll say it again. Sense of unworthiness, all this is in a clear description of pride and ignorance because Christ Jesus made us worthy. Yes. All our righteousness in him. He's there. Oh, he's acceptable. Oh, hallelujah. Holy and acceptable unto the living God. And so I present myself a holy and acceptable offering to God. What do you believe about what God has said about you? And what do you believe about you? Because what you believe will affect every dimension of your life. What you believe. The power of God's here. The anointing of the Holy Ghost is here. God's changing anyone who wants to be changed. He's helping anyone who wants to be helped. He's softening anyone who wants to be softened. He's forgiving anybody who wants to be forgiven. Satan would try to cause you to look inward. Satan would try to make you feel like a failure. God didn't say you were a failure. He said, I'll make you a success. All you got to do is repent. He said, I'm, he didn't say, I'll make you a failure. The only way the arm of the Lord and the power and the strength of the Lord is going to be revealed to you is that you're going to accept what he said about you. Every yoke broken in Jesus' name. Every offense removed in Jesus' name. Every curse broken in Jesus' name. Every sin removed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. It's time to go, it's time to go forth and conquer. Yeah, amen. It's time to, time to go forth and subdue. Mm -hmm. God doesn't move by imagination. He, remo he moves by strong passion yes. of the heart. Yes. I give no place to imagination. Not to say I don't have imagination to try to kick in on me. I just throw them down real quickly because I realize that they'll ring, lead me in a way opposite to the Father. I'm calling you. We're calling you today. We're calling you to come. We're calling you to come in complete conformity to the Word of God, complete surrender to His will. To say, Lord, to do Your will, that's all I want to do. To be faithful in the things that God has given you to do, but don't put them before, before the Lord. Don't make them an excuse for why you can't give your life and your talents to God and can fulfill the things that God's called you to do. I don't want no part-time Christians, says the Lord. Huh? Part-time worship leaders, part-time singers, part-time praisers. Because it really profaned his name. Because the other, what are you doing at the other part of the time? So they see you now, they see you now in a position of being the servant of the Lord, giving him praise and giving him honor. What do they see you doing the rest of the time? Oh, so that's how you, that's the way you're supposed to live? That's what pleases God? Profane, profane his name. It's time to become a full-time worshiper. Full-time praiser. Hallelujah. Praise God. A full-time minister of his. Amen. To, 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 be, to be allowed, to be allowed to step into a place 
of ministering to the Lord before the Lord, and you're going to take that for granted? You're going to act like that's just something you can do part-time? You're not worthy of these things. You counted yourself unworthy of these things. Because there could be no higher call, no higher privilege, no higher position than you being allowed to function in the anointing, and you should not give your whole heart to it? Well, you count yourself, you disqualify yourself. You show yourself what you believe about God. It's more religious than it is relational. You listen to me. And the sad reality of it is, is more people have lived in religion than they've lived in relationship. Because relationship always produces this kind of faith that I'm talking about, kind of consecration I'm talking about, kind of surrender I'm talking about. God's calling you, calling you to come. It's never too late, it's never too late. It's never too late, it's never too late. Christ Jesus calling you. If there's anything God wants right now is he wants the life of Jesus to be revealed in you. If there's anything God wants right now is he wants the life of Jesus to be, if there's anything God wants right now, he wants the life of Jesus to be, he wants you, he wants you to be excited and passionate about your place and purpose in the kingdom of God. He doesn't want you to take your inheritance to be given all the inheritance of heaven to be made an heir of God and a co-inheritor with Jesus Christ. Throw it to the side and trade it for a bowl of beans. Because you're hungry right now. You gotta have, I'm hungry right now. I got, I'm more concerned about my own personal need, my own personal interest. What is the inheritance to me? That's why the Lord warns all the church, don't be like Esau who sold his inheritance. He didn't say to people living in the Old Testament that he sought forgiveness. He re sought to repentance but could not find it. He talked to people like that in the New Testament. He didn't talk to people in the Old Testament saying to them, I'd rather that you be hot or cold. But if you lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. I'll testify to all the world that you have nothing to do with me. You talk to people in the New Testament. Church, we got to grab that. Because right now, false doctrine, apostasy rises to steal the hearts of men like never before. Father's going to Father's gonna deal with it. He's not going to let an unreached world be taken prisoner by a lukewarm church. By a church overwhelmed by demon doctrines that would make sin acceptable to God. He's not going to let the world, I tell you right now, he's not going to let the world, he's not going to let the world be stolen away by the tricks of Satan that he works in the midst of the church of Jesus Christ. Not so long as there's people like me. Not so long as there's people like me saying there's no way. God has not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's not as long as there's people like me lifting up their voice, calling folks to repentance, to get right with God, getting in your face and getting in your space and saying to you right here at this very moment, you cannot say that you're on your way to heaven, that you're living a life of a born-again believer and walking in the things that belong to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Today is the day for you to repent. Today is the day for you to swear allegiance to God. Go home, get the stuff out of your house that is going to cause seeds of unholiness to be lodged into your heart. Where you got to wake up in the night or in the morning with unholy images in your mind. You have to deal with vain imaginations that's been propagated by things that you've listened to right out of hell to the various different medias of radio and the television instead of singing the songs of praises my soul shall rise and bless you my soul shall rise and bless you you're having to try to get some secular song out of your head this exalting the lust of flesh the pride of life and the lust of the eye it's exalting unholy relationships. It's time, radical time. It's time. It's time. These are the days. Come out from among them. Be separate, says God, and I'll receive you. God wasn't talking to the Old Testament people. He's talking to the New Testament church. Second Corinthians chapter 6 is not in the Old Testament. It's not in the Old Testament. 
Come out from among them. Be separate. Touch not the unclean thing, and I shall receive you, says God. I will be a God to you, and you be people to me. You'll be my people. God's called you and I to perfect holiness in the fear of God. He didn't talk about the Old Testament. It's not Old Testament, that's New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Just be, it's the next chapter, chapter 6. He said, touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Men would try to remove all these things out of the Bible. There's a great movement right now to make all the sayings of Jesus not applicable to the New Testament, to the New Testament church right now. He had a transition ministry. That's just the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. Major ministries are saying these things, invalidating the words of Jesus as applicable to our lives right now. It's true. I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna name names yet. I wait, I'll name names when the Lord tells me to start naming names. Paul named names when the Lord told him to. I'm just telling you people, there's a rise of apostasy. There's dece deceiving spirits. There's doctrines of devils. And the more you compromise, the more you, the more you're vulnerable to them. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I want you to be able to wake up in the morning with all your heart, be able to say, "Have your own way, Lord." Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. I want you to be able to say that. Mold me and make me. And know that when you say that, he's doing it. He, that he's going to do it. And everything that's going on, you're right under the mold and shape and hand of the potter. Mold me and make me after your will. Lord, I am waiting, yielded and still. That's your life. I want you to stand with me. Father, I thank you for this company of people that are willing to respond to your voice, she's fine, that are willing to hearken unto your call, that are willing to value those things, Lord, that you have blessed us with, the riches of heaven as greater riches than anything. Moses was right. He saw the anointing. He saw the anointing. And he said, if the anointing it's far better than all the fame and the fortune that I have being called a member of Pharaoh's family. Can you think about the process that he went through as he sat there and took a daisy and said, I love you, I love you not. I'm going to surrender, I'll surrender not. As he began to think about and justify, you know, if I just stay here in the palace, think about all the influence I can have on the Pharaoh. Think about all the influence I could have on the empire and nation of Egypt. People make these things up in their mind all the time. Oh, just think about it. If I just stay here in this community of compromisers, if I just stay over here in this place of all of these folks who do these evil, ungodly things, and I, and I accommodate them and I acquiesce to them, how much influence? You have the wrong influence. He'd rather have the reproaches of the anointing. Hallelujah. I'm asking you. God's asking you right now. There's changes. Look, there's changes. I don't want you to waffle. I don't want you to waver anymore. I don't want you to imagine. I don't want you to imaginate anymore. I don't want you to imagine things to be different from how God's declared them. I want you to, today, God is saying, harden not your heart. Conform to exactly what he said to do. Yeah. 
If your job's about the kingdom of God, then let's get on, let's get a, let's get on with the program. Let's make it part. Let's make it about the kingdom of God now, huh? Yeah, I want you to listen to me. Those people listen by the web. Your job is about the kingdom of God. Here, all these people are talking about advancing the kingdom of God. How much money do you have in the bank now to advance the kingdom of God that you're holding on to? What is it? I mean, what is it? If God told you to go do that, then my goodness, you must have a lot stored up. Because what God calls us to do, He empowers us to get it done. Amen? People, make your job, come on, make your life, start, make your life about God. Make your life about Jesus. Today, I don't want you to walk out of here pretending. I want you to walk out of here saying, for me to live is Christ Jesus. That's it. I'm done with the rest. Quit pretending. Quit staggering back and forth between two opinions. Well, yeah, I'm sold out. Well, you know, now things have been going so good. And you're, whatever, depending on what tide it is, that's what level you are. Tide's out right now. We're down. Tide's in. We're up. The Lord says, you can, you're not moving in faith. You can't have any of this. You can't have anything. You're not going to get anything. You're unstable. Get stable. Stop going in and out. Up and down. Are you with me? Yeah. It's time for you and I to step into the relationship we've been called to have. Because if we don't, the world, our generation will go without a witness. Or the Lord's going to have to bring people in from Alabama and Mississippi and Georgia and Pennsylvania because ain't nobody here in California is willing to do anything for them. I'm tr it's true. Because God's going to do what he's going to do through his church. People sold out. He had to bring folks in from out of town, out of state, out of nation. There's a lot of folks that believe that right now. God's having to bring missionaries in because everybody in the, everybody in the United States of America is abdicated. So he's got to bring people in from Africa, from India. Because nobody here in America is even, doing, even anywhere near to be used by God. Turn his church back into a place of, of walking with him doing what's right except for me and a few others like me and by their confession because it's true because I know who I am I believe in who I am because I believe in what God made me what do you believe about you what do you believe about you huh what do you believe about you because what you believe about you is going to affect every dimension of your life what do you believe about you False humility ain't going to work in God. God gives boldness, confidence. I'll say it again. A sense of unworthiness is nothing other than a manifestation of pride and ignorance. Come on now, who are you? What are you going to do with who you are? Father, put a crown upon your head. What are you going to do? Go home, sit on a shelf when you leave here. Let it sit there for the rest of the week. Invite people over to see your crown. Wear it. And don't just wear it for show. Wear it as a crown of authority to go do stuff with it. You tell the devil where he's got to go, you set people free, huh? And point to the crown. Right. Which represents Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 That's why I believe that boldness, confidence, assurance, they all fruits of the Spirit. You walk in the Holy Ghost, you're going to have boldness. You're going to move in faith, you're going to have yourself some boldness. You're not going to have, because you can, fear can't work where faith is at. Yeah, true. You're going to have to have yourself some boldness and some confidence and some assurance. No problem when you know how much he loves you. No problem when you recognize how committed he is to you. No problem. when you sell out to him because until you sell out to him you'll never understand how much he loves you and never understand how much how committed he is to you oh God he loves me and he's committed to me so that allows me to go continue on in sin that's deception I'm gonna say it again oh God loves me. I know how God much God loves me and how committed he is to me and that's how I am allowed to continue on in sin and justifies me to continue on in sin it's not even nowhere anywhere near truth
Father, in the name of Jesus. I'm just going to, I'm going to deal with a couple more words of knowledge. That's all I'm doing. Just flow in a couple words of knowledge. I'm dealing with people in terms of their surrender. That's what I'm doing because I closed several minutes ago the meeting. I'm just doing, if, if you don't know this about me, I'm actually moving in words of knowledge and I'm giving it in general. I'm not embarrassing anybody. I'm just calling it out in general. I'm just dealing with the states of the heart. That's all I'm doing. This is the way I minister. I've been doing this now for 33 years, just like this. Nothing's changed other than maturity. I had a preacher say, one, I had another preacher, this guy thought he was a preacher, said to me, no, he said to me, he said, you really think you're something special, don't you? I said, yeah. <laughs> Three weeks later, he went blind. I am special. He should have repented. Because he just opened up the door for the enemy. You better watch out when you're confronting the anointing. You better watch out. Yeah. Better be careful. Better be careful. Oh, you really think you're something special? Yeah, absolutely. I am very special. I'm an heir of God, joint heir with Christ Jesus. I've, I've been set in a place to speak in his stead. And he's backing up every word I'm speaking. He's right here with me, declaring everything I'm saying, calling people out. Because he's got to have a church that's going to come into agreement with him. That's all he's looking for. He's got a church that wants to have a church coming into agreement with him. People defy God, rebel against God, rebel against his ministry, have catastrophe, and then they create doctrines about how God is in the midst of all of their catastrophes. Not. Well, there's a good keeper. So, protects us. Protects us. Joshua ran out yesterday, on Saturday, Joshua ran out, it was Friday, yeah, Friday, Joshua ran out real quickly to get some things because they were going to meet us, come pick up Anna, and when he did, he left the front door open, they live in a pretty tough neighborhood in Santa Cruz, and the next thing we, ne the next thing Allie knew is there was a man completely drunk out of his mind, banging, slamming things around, trying to get in the front door, it was just a screen door, completely unlocked, he couldn't get in the front door, somebody said he was too drunk to get in, no, Angel of the Lord. God protects his people. Yes, he does. God protects his people. God's going to protect me. He's going to deliver me out of every trap, every snare. I mean, you're going to, you're going to keep me. I will not fall. I will not stumble. I will not trip. Nothing, nothing. Evil will befall those who are walking with God. It's, it's, people's, it's people's stubbornness and rebellion and resistance of the Holy Ghost. They get themselves in troubles with their, with their own response, with their listening to the lies of hell. Not they don't even have a discernment to recognize that God the Holy Ghost would never be sowing that kind of discord and creating those kinds of attitudes and feelings because they have nothing to do with love, nothing to do with peace, nothing to do with submission, nothing to do with humility, nothing to do with servitude, nothing to do with laying down your life. I'm going to ask you once again, what do you believe that God said about you? And what do you believe about you? And do they agree? I'm going to ask you once again. Because I'm going to tell you right now, more importantly than what you supposedly know about the Bible, it's what you do with the Word of God, how it's manifested through your life. Listen to me now. Listen. What do you know about God? What do you believe about God? What do you believe about what the Bible says about God? Do they agree? Amen? Amen. I think I've dealt with everything. I think it's done. I think the atmosphere is pretty clean right now. I'm, I must honestly say there were some people in here despising authority and resisting the anointing at the beginning of the meeting with accusations in the heart against me. But they're not against me. They're against God because I'm not my own person. I'm his representative. I don't live. He lives. Your problem is not with me, it's with my master. And I, I'm praising God that most of that's all cleaned up now. Amen. Praise God, most of that's cleaned up. But why must, we, why must we ever clean this thing up again? There's some people that are still standing here right now. You're going to go and you're going to do exactly tonight what you've done every night up to this point. You're going to go back tomorrow and you're going to live just like you've been living. And you will ultimately find yourself in perdition because you refuse to obey. There are those people in here. 
unfortunately. And they've been warned, and they've been warned, and they've been warned again and again, but they've hardened their hearts against God. And what happens to the anointing, and if you're standing on the anointing, is you harden, if you harden your heart against God, the anointing makes your heart even harder. And if you soften your heart towards God and you truly repent, man, I'm telling you right now, your heart gets softer. It would be better for you to fall down on your face and repent with total abandonment and get up tomorrow morning and go live like you've been living rather than to hang on yourself and resist God the Holy Ghost and go back and live like you've been living. Because one could ultimately hear one day. One will ultimately be taken over by the Holy Ghost one day because God's just that merciful. But if we don't have our, if he doesn't have our participation, if he doesn't have our belief, if he doesn't have our cooperation, nothing can ever change. Well, amen. Thank you, Jesus. There's four people in this place right now. Four people. There are four people in this place right now. The Holy Ghost has literally been wrestling with you through this meeting. It should be the other way around. We should be wrestling with Him because we're so earnest about having that which He wants to give. But He's been wrestling with you, trying to persuade you. like for everybody, especially God, all you guys in the back and everybody in the back, just kind of come up here. Come up to the front. Come get up here with us just for a minute. The camera will be fine right where it stands. I, you, one person can stay there. Jacqueline, you can stay there just in case. Because I know there's people that are watching. I want you to just come. Nathan, I want you to come. I, honestly, there should be no need to turn any knobs. It really is not going anywhere. Once it's set, you know, things bolted down, it's not going to fly around. <laughs> Praise God. Come on out. Come on down. Come on down. From back there, come on down. people, we don't want to see anybody lost on a day. Some of you, this has never become a serious matter. Well, I think it's, so I think there's actually some in here who is, it's been a serious matter at times, but you've drifted from that moment of it being real serious matter, and you've accommodated things in this world. You just, you just got to let go, you know. Got to let go. Trust yourself to the Lord. If you're poor and can't feed yourself, I'll feed you. I'll take care of you. How many believes that? If I, if, you, if I were to say to you, I'll feed you, I'll take care of you, I'll give you a place to stay, that I would do that. If you just a total abandonment, go serve the Lord. Well, good. Well, Father said that. And I promise you. He did a far better job than any human being on the planet. So this day, I want you to, just, I want you to, just, I want you to put work in its proper place. There is a proper place for work, okay? And when you start full time in the ministry, I'm telling you right now, you're going to, you're going to work harder than you've ever worked in your life. But it'd be the right kind of work. You sleep really good at night, and you wake up feeling excellent in the morning. I, want to, I just want to begin to pray right now because it's strong words to say that there are people in here that would go into perdition. It's very concerning to me. I don't want that to be true. I don't want that to be true. But 
when we feel and, and come up against the resistance, when there would be resistance in people's hearts. That's got to be dealt with. And obviously, the Holy Ghost is dealing with that. And that the reality is to even consider that there are people that are in this place right now that are running the risk of totally missing out on heaven. I can't even begin to abide that. I can't even begin to abide that. I'd rather wrestle you to the ground and plead with you, whatever, beg you. But I know that Father won't violate your will. I can't violate your will. I can plead with you because he's going to plead with you. You cannot stand before God and be asked, will you repent right now and say no and not run a risk of selling your soul to hell, Satan. Are you with me? Well, listen, I, I, I just want us, to, I want us to reach to God for every... I want to see the thousands and the tens of thousands and the hundred thousand saved. But I don't want to see any single soul lost that is in this place. I can't abide that. I, I, can't, I can't tolerate that. It's, it's very difficult for me to look at people that are wrong and not willing to beg God to be right. You don't even have to beg them. All you have to do is surrender your heart. So we're just going to spend some time here just praying for one another, just believing God that there would not be one soul in this place lost. Not one soul in this place lost. Not one soul in this place lost. Today, Father, we consecrate ourselves to you to live in such a way that Holy Ghost conviction can so f fall upon the church that, the, that your presence that brings that holy fear, the fear of God and the hating of evil will so rest upon our society and our culture Father, that none of us will give strength to the powers of darkness by the participation with it. That none of us will actually be an intercessor against your Holy Ghost conviction because we ourselves will not come under the conviction. But every one of us, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, let Holy Ghost conviction fall so strong upon our souls. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus.
one in this place be lost. Father, we pray that no one in this place should go into perdition. Father, with it, every person in this place, oh God, would be saved. Lives would be absolutely surrendered to you. Father, we cry out to you for your mercy. I just I keep hearing over again in my spirit. It's time to seek the Lord. It's time to seek the Lord. So I said, "Well, I've been seeking Him. I wouldn't argue with the Lord. I would just say yes." So I said, "What do you expect? Signs, wonders, miracles—a full display of the power of God released to your life. Souls coming into the kingdom by the tens of thousands, by the hundreds. Listen." God's not interested in numbers. He's interested in power. The numbers will come when the power is there. I have heard for 33 years in my life, I've heard God say over and again, you can go back and you look at tapes, listen to tapes that I preached 33 years ago. Same message, the Lord's saying, I'm looking for a church that will represent me. God's not willing to have the great harvest that he would bring in to ultimately be ruined because they've got the wrong models. They're not seeing the body of Christ, the ministry of Jesus. They're rather seeing strife, seeing division, seeing unwillingness to cooperate, everybody doing it their own way, or even half the people doing it their own way. Because I'm telling you right now, 50% of the people doing it their own way, 50% of the people doing God's way, every time the 50% of the people doing it their own way, Satan will highlight them. It will eclipse the good. Well, I'm telling you, that's just the way it works. It's the way it works. I want God's judgments to be in the house. And I ask God to let his judgments begin with me. Are you willing to do that? I want God's judgments to be in the house. I want his judgment to begin with me. I want fall, his judgment fall on me to start with. Are you willing to do that? Father tells us to assemble ourselves together all the more as we see the day approaching. To do anything less is to be disobedient to what he said to do. What is he doing? He's giving us the place of safety. That's what he's telling you. Saying, it's like him saying, okay, when you see this happening, come over here and you're going to be fine. It's like him saying, okay, I want you to come into the ark because it's the only place safe. And then people say, oh, you know what? If they just expect too much of us. If we're not in all the meetings, then they're upset with us. They don't think we're as right with God as they are. That's nonsense. That's demonic. That's a lie from hell. You're fighting against God saying it. You're actually being a voice of the enemy saying, trying to stop the church from moving forward by saying such things. That's what I'm saying. I don't want to see anybody. I, I'm trying my very best as, as long as the Lord had given me liberty to break it down for people so that they will understand what's right, what's wrong. And I know I fear with this thing because I know the Lord examines people's hearts. I understand how the Lord doesn't, do, he doesn't disclose everything. Because he lets the heart make the decision. It's like he could have warned Adam. He could have told Adam everything that was going to happen. He didn't. He placed right and wrong before him and left it there because it would be the state of his heart that would make all the decision. If he's going to make the one decision right, he'd make all decisions right. If he's going to make the one decision wrong, he'd make all decisions wrong. That's the way God is. That's why he keeps it so simple. We get into these boisterous explanations, wrestling with people, trying to convince them. And I praise God for the scripture that says, you know, basically knowing the severity of God, we thus persuade men. I mean, at least we can argue a little bit, you know, get after them. You know, to plead with men. I see God pleading with God, with men. And so that allows me then, and affords me the privilege of pleading with men. But I'm always recognizing that I've got to stop short of violating anybody's will. Because I want to violate your will. I want to make you. Yeah, well, you know what? It's like making you get out of the house because it's on fire. It's burning down. It's making you get out of, the, out of the place that the bomb's about ready to drop. Forgive me while I'm trying to save your life. I just got to recognize, I can't go, I can only go so far. I can't grab a hold of you and pull you to safety.
like the Lord could have said many things to the rich man about all that he would gain if he went and sold all that he had. He could have preached the sermon that Paul preached to the Philippians. He could have preached the sermon that Paul preached to the Corinthians. He didn't. He left it the state of the heart. Because if you're going to choose right with your, if your heart's right, you're going to choose right on this one thing, you'll choose right on everything. If your heart's wrong and you choose wrong on this one thing, you're going to choose wrong on everything. So why go into the display of it? To not convince with words, but by the demonstration of the Holy Ghost and power. And I know, there, I know there's a place, there's a balance. There's a balance. I'm, 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 gonna, I'm going to wrestle with you. I'm going to plead with you. I'm going to cry out to God on your behalf. Because I, I, want, I, want I don't want what I said to be. I don't want what I said to be. What happens? I don't want four people in this place that I saw come before my, before my vision go into perdition. I don't want that. I, I, cannot, I cannot abide that. We cannot have that. I cannot stand. I will not stand by and watch that happen. If there's anything I can do, I will not stand by and watch that happen. I will plead with you. I cry out to God for you. I pray in Jesus' name that every one of you with like heart and like mind, you'll cry out to God and say, Lord, let there not be one among us lost. Let there not be one among us continue to stand creating problems, creating problems in the midst of the ministry. The Lord told me that if you give yourself to drunkenness, if there's any fornicators among us who will not repent, he told us to cast you out. He told us not to keep company with you. Why? Because the name of the Lord would be profaned. First of all, you're going to be wide open to hearing everything that Satan's got to say against the anointing because you've opened your heart to his, on the highest level. God said, if you commit fornication, I'll destroy your soul in hell. That's what God says. I will personally, so there's anything he says that, about. I'll destroy you in hell. Balaam was there prophesying over Israel every good thing when they were rebellious, but as soon as they got into fornication, Father sent a plague. He hadn't changed. He sent God Old Testament, New Testament. And when you're given an opportunity to repent and you want to hold on to it and you want to justify yourself and say you're right, dear Lord Jesus, that, was, that, that is selling your soul to the devil. Selling, it's selling your soul to Satan. You think you can control it. You can't control nothing. I'm telling you right now, you no match for Satan. You can't control nothing. You're not making any decisions on your own. That's a, that's a fantasy. It's a farce. You have to come get over here where I'm at to be able to see the clarity of it. Just come over here, stand in the light. You and I, if we lay hold on God, if we'll take a hold of our inheritance, if we will not allow the threats of the enemy to stop us from walking in the authority that God has given us. I'm telling you, he'll raise us up and use us to save this whole region. We'll be salt, we'll be light. I'm not going to abide stuff. I'm not going to accommodate those things that are keeping the lost by the tens of thousands and hundred thousands from coming into the kingdom. When I recognize that if I simply obey, if you simply obey, if we do what God says for us to do, we go all the way with God in this thing that he's preparing to do through our lives, whether it takes one year or 50 years, we give ourselves faithfully to it. Then all, men be, all these men will be saved. I'm not going to stand around and accommodate one person who doesn't want to listen to God. Meanwhile, for doing that, we forfeit hundreds of thousands of people that would have come into the kingdom. I don't value my soul more important than 100,000 other souls. Do you value your soul as more important than 100,000 other souls? Or a million or 10 million? Or even one? Even one. You value your soul more important than another soul? That's not what Jesus showed us. He laid down his soul because he valued our lives above his self to re redeem us, to win us. I'm going to follow Jesus. You do whatever you want to do, I'm going to follow God. You serve who you're going to serve, but I'm going to follow the Lord. You can't, you're going to have to, you're going to have to come follow us. You're going to have to come follow us. We're warning you today. Come follow us. Come go with us. Don't cut cross grain to us. Come plow with us. Come, come imitate us. Imitate us. Do what we do. Move where we move. Go where we go. If you have a problem with that, if you don't see us moving where Jesus is moving, going where Jesus is going, then I can understand why you need to go do something different. But because you hear God's got you here, move with us. Go with us. Participate with us. 
go after this thing. I mean, Geneva has been telling me that the prayer meetings have been over the top. And that's, I'm telling you, that's changed, that'll change things. Nothing will change things like prayer. Faith is, you can see in every model of faith, the Lord's showing faith and the activity of faith and the activation of faith and the release of faith in the midst of prayer, in the midst of prayer. And you don't ever going to get it until you start participating with it. I'll tell you, parents, if you don't, you know, this is a terrible thing to say, but just trying to wrestle with you. My goodness gracious, your kids are going to imitate you. If you go to hell, they're probably going to go to hell too. Huh? If you just religious, they're probably just going to be religious too. If you go to heaven, they're probably going to go to heaven too. All I'm saying, just look, you've got a lot of reasons here. Got a lot of reasons. You have a lot of reasons to lay, to lay hold on eternal life. To grasp a hold of the life of Jesus Christ and do not let go of it. Don't you separate the eternal life from the life of Jesus. Listen, those of you listening to me on the web, do not separate eternal life from the life of Jesus because they are one and the same. If you do not have the life of Jesus, you do not have eternal life. If you're not living the life of Jesus, you're not living an eternal life. They are inseparable. They are inseparable. When you see the law of sin and death trying to work against you, you have power and authority over it because you've been given the spiritual laws of life that are in Christ Jesus to be able to overthrow everything that Satan would try to do against you. But you want to walk with a broken and contrite heart before the living God. You want to walk humbly before your, your, your master. You want to walk submitted before him. If you're arrogant in one area, you arrogant in another. If you're arrogant with me, you're arrogant with him. You listen to me. If you're arrogant with God's people, you, uh, God's leadership, you're arrogant with Him, uh, the Holy Ghost. If you defy it before His representative, you defy it before Him. Everything that is going on in your life is an evidence and a proof of where you really are at with God. That's why the Lord says, you can't say that you love me when you hate your brother. You can't say that you love me whom you have not seen when you hate your brother whom you have seen. Because He's saying, everything that's going on in our life that we see and understand and experience is evidence is evidence of what's really going on in the unseen realm. Amen. Amen. Just walk humbly with the Lord. Just depend upon Him. Just trust in Jesus. Just trust in Jesus. Just trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Bring baby here. Let me pray over him. How much longer do we get? How much longer do we get you guys? We still get you guys for two more months. A month and a half. Month and a half. Come over here, man. Just crying out. You need to be anointed, strengthened, right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the blessings. Mom, it's hot. I'm thirsty. It's time to go do something different. No, no. You want to step over in this realm of heaven? Live here for the rest of your life. So is Mama. <laughs> so is Daddy. <laughs> cool. So is grandfather and grandmother. Yeah, so is the whole family. I see revival come in your house. I see it. I see it happening. Things are happening in the spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, amen. We'll be back here tonight, 5 o'clock for prayer, 6 o'clock, start the meeting. And what we're doing is we're crying out to God, come, rain down His glory. We're seeking the Lord. Somebody said, what are we going to go to church for? Seek God. Hear His voice, to draw nigh to Him, to respond to everything He's got to say to us. That's all. Why come to the meeting and resist the Holy Ghost? Why? What, what value is there? Right? There's no value in that, is there? Just don't do that. Just come and just yield it. Come yield it. Surrender. Amen. Right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, I'm going to tell you this. For every person that's standing in this place who's purposed in their life to walk with God and to serve Him, I tell you, nothing of your past is regarded by the Lord as completely removed and washed away. 
I tell you, there's nothing of the past that can hinder you or hold you back. The same call that God had on your life when He first called you is unchanging. The same opportunity to grow and mature and all the things of God are still available to you. All your heart has got to be right. You've got to have to be willing to say, I don't care. I leave it all behind. I take everything and lay it aside. All I want is you. I esteem my love for you, Father, better than houses and land, wife, husband, daughter, brother, mother, father. I love my family. I love my children. And everybody probably should really know that. But I love Father more. If I have to take sides, I'm going with him. Hallelujah. Look at Job. He didn't go with his wife. His wife said, curse God and die, man. Forget about it. He's, he's abandoning you. Abandon him. He's like, no, woman. He loved Father more than he loved his wife. Amen. Huh? If my wife wants to leave and go somewhere else, she's going to go on her own. Let me tell you something that I believe. I'm going to tell you this. I'm just going to say this. I can't. I got permission to say this. I'm going to say this. You'll find out when you get to heaven because it's not revealed. I believe that if all Adam had to do was stand strong, when Eve disobeyed, and the Lord would have healed her, it would not have had an effect. He'd have been an intercessor for her because that's the way God is. He allowed him, he, he abdicated his authority as the man because the woman is hidden behind the man. The woman has to give an account to the man. And under the authority of the man, the man has to give the direct account to the Lord. Huh? He didn't follow, he was willing to follow his wife. There's too many people have been willing to follow their wife. Men, I'm going to tell you right now, if you're leading your wife in the long, wrong way, you are in serious trouble. Your wife may be right and you're going to be taken out. Because Papa then. Because in here, you're affecting your, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. I believe this. I believe I can. I believe this. I believe this. I can show you that many of the things that I said, I, I can prove it in the Word. Some of it I can't prove. And I, I hope that you always understand that when I can't prove something in the Word, I'm going to tell you. This is what I believe. This is what I think. Come on, men. Lead your family down the wrong road. You think that food's more important to them than their spiritual life? Clothing's more important to them than being, than being constantly held before the throne of heaven and protected by the power of God that's at work through your life? Look, let's get our values right. Let's get our values right. Amen. Just, and it's so simple. Father's made it so simple, hasn't he? You don't have to climb Mount Everest. You don't have to do some special feat. You just got to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I want to do what's right. And he makes it all right. Beautiful, isn't it? What must I do to be saved? Call upon the name of the Lord, and you'll be saved in your house. But pride and stubbornness and arrogancy and self-will, they are strong, powerful defiers of God. They are strong and powerful a defier as Satan is himself. And it's a repetition of his act. And it's perdition. perdition. So this day forward, in Jesus' name, believe good things. Yes. Believe what God said. Amen. And I want you to find the good things. The life of Jesus. Amen. Walking in the Holy Ghost. Doing the will of the Father. That's it. That's it. That's it. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. I want you to say, my sins are forgiven me for his name's sake. And I never want to sin again. The household of faith. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah.